Sage City. A city with tall white skyscrapers. The doors opened. A flash of bright light. A man's silhouette emerged through it into the crowd. He stood on a high pedestal. Down below, the crowd chanted, Sage, Sage. The blonde guy in the light white cloak looked not down at the cheering crowd, but up at the shining bright sun. The war, which lasted 500 years, took many lives. Finally, it will be over. The blonde guy spread his arms out to the sides and announced to the crowd that as long as he lived, there would be no more wars in the world. The crowd responded by thanking the sage for bringing peace to the world. With the levitation ability, the guy, without making a single movement, soared into the sky and flew towards the sage's throne. He closed his eyes and memories swirled in his head. Five hundred years ago, the world changed, and suddenly all living things gained divine power. The great turmoil began, which lasted five hundred years and was called the end of time. Through countless critical moments and opportunities, he became the strongest. His name was Lin Yunfeng, and he possessed supreme strength unrivaled in the world. In one fell swoop, he pacified the forces of both sides of the conflict. There is peace in this world at last. Now he could rest properly and enjoy this matchless precious tranquility. The boy sat on his throne, propping his head up with a hand that was bowed in sleep. Suddenly someone's footsteps were heard. Someone was running towards the sage. Lin Yunfeng raised his head and asked the guest, didn't he say that no one was allowed to come to him while he was in his throne room? A guy with dark hair and wearing a black sleeveless shirt stated that these rules did not concern him, brother Lin Yunfeng. Lin Yunfeng called him the most naughty of all his siblings and then asked, what was the matter? The guy took out a small card, showed it to Lin Yunfeng, and said that it was a talisman, a secret letter from the Tao sex sect head. Lin Yunfeng, upon hearing about the Tao sect, immediately thought of Kain Fangsu. She was an extremely smug woman who would never ask for anything. Why did she send the Yin talisman they had agreed upon with all the clans of the world to only establish communication in emergencies? Lin Yunfeng took the Yin talisman from his brother and told him to get lost. Suddenly, Lin Yunfeng remembered something humiliating. Fifteen years ago, he had practiced the secret of nine turns of primordial chaos in one secret cold water hole. Lin Yunfeng was at the threshold of the critical point of his training in realizing the mystery of life and death when this woman suddenly burst in. She jumped out of the thicket toward the backwater, a beautiful brunette with a strong gaze and wearing a black tattered dress. She then took another leap and landed right in front of Lin Yunfeng. She immediately wrapped her arms around him and pressed herself tightly against his body. Lin Yunfeng was perplexed. In his eyes that was a lot of chut spa. He asked her who she was to bother him. Immediately afterward, three ninjas armed with swords ran up to the creek. One of them turned to Tuan Fangsu. He told her that he hadn't expected her to be so good at cultivation. He added that she had been poisoned by the potent Yang powder and yet was still able to run so far away, hoping to find help. The ninja said that now they would kill them both. The black ninjas ran to attack Lin Yunfeng and Kuan Fangsu. Lin Yunfeng waved his hand in their direction, using the frozen water sword ability, and a multitude of magic beams rained down on the enemies. All three ninjas were defeated. They lay by the shore, bleeding scarlet. Lin Yunfeng took the exhausted woman in his arms and jumped out of the water onto the ground with her, leaping over the defeated enemies. Lin Yunfeng held the woman in his arms and suddenly felt her heart beat. He felt air begin to move along the side of the vessel, which was spinning out of control. Lin Yunfeng put Qian Fangsu on the ground. She was unconscious. Lin Yunfeng sat down on the ground, crossed his legs under him and began to meditate. He held his breath and concentrated. It was necessary to direct the air back to the source, controlling the air to bring the network of vessels into order. Lin Yunfeng was focused. A purple scar was visible on his left chest. Suddenly a woman's palm lay on his right breast. He turned around and saw Kun and Fangsu. She had already started to hug him with both arms and looked Lin Yunfeng straight in the eyes. He was at a loss to guess what she was up to.
He was in a bad way. He couldn't move, for one movement could undo all his efforts. Lin Yunfeng yelled at the woman, telling her to get out as he had no time for her. Qiu Yun Feng Su did not heed his dictates, saying that her situation was urgent, and asked Lin Yunfeng to help get the poison out of her. Qin Feng Sui pressed Lin Yunfeng against her and kissed her. Lin Yunfeng had never experienced such strong feelings that overwhelmed him at that moment. A little while later, Lin Yunfeng sat in the lotus posture and tried to concentrate. Qin Feng Su was standing beside him and fixing her hair. She turned to him and told him if he had any problems in the future, all he had to do was mention her name, and she would definitely repay him for his help today. Lin Yunfeng was angry at the woman. He felt that she had tarnished his purity and left just like that. He had memorized Kian Feng Su. It was his humiliating memory. Lin Yunfeng sat on his throne, holding the talisman in his hand, and still couldn't believe that he... Lin Yunfeng, the hero of the era, had been used by Qian Feng Shu as a tool to neutralize the poison. Later, during the battle that had all the clans besieging the demon clan, he saw her again. Qian Feng Shu, as if not remembering anything, extended her hand to Lin Yunfeng and introduced herself. Qian Feng Shu, Dao Clan, Order of the Nine States. She was certain that this was their first time meeting. Lin Yunfeng shook her hand and said that he felt that this was not their first meeting and that they had seen each other before. Tuyen Feng Sui replied that she allowed that, but also added that she had a bad memory for male faces. What irritated Lin Yunfeng even more was that they had worked together many times since then during battles, and all this time she had treated him like a stranger. Tuyen Feng Sui truly possessed courage and bravery not inferior to men. She had the conscience to put her life on the line for peace. After years of fierce struggle, she became the new head of the Tao sect. Lin Yunfeng activated the talisman, from which a light image immediately burst out. It was the image of Kuan Feng Su. She gave Lin Yunfeng a message that they had important business to discuss. She informed him that she would be waiting for him at midnight at the peak of the peak of no return behind the Tao sect. Lin Yunfeng thought that the demonic invasion had already been suppressed. There was a question. What other extremely important matter could be required to use the Yin talisman? At midnight, Lin Yunfeng flew to the peak of the peak of no return behind the Tao sect. Lin Yunfeng looked around and saw the same water hole away from the peak where he had first met Ken Fangshu. This really surprised him. Ken Fangshu, as if it was bad luck, had chosen that very spot. The humiliating memories visited him again. He remembered her kiss again. He walked over to a wooden terrace with a table and a few chairs and sat down on one. Suddenly, someone's silhouette appeared behind Lin Yunfeng's back. A female voice announced that the sage had arrived a little earlier than expected. Lin Yunfeng turned around and saw Qian Feng Su wearing a long white dress on the doorstep. Tuyin Feng Shui sat down at the table across from Lin Yunfeng. Using magic, she conjured up cups and a teapot for them, directed a stream of water from the backwater into the open kettle, boiled it, and poured the drink into the cup. Tuyin Feng Shui handed a cup to Lin Yunfeng, said that there was a famous 500-year-old Da Hun Pao tea, and offered the sage a taste of it. Lin Yunfeng took a sip from the cup and asked Kuan Feng Su to tell him which of the followers of the unrighteous path were plotting something. Qian Feng Sui replied that this meeting was about their son. Lin Yunfeng didn't understand the woman's words at first, completely calmly asked her what was wrong with their son, and took a couple sips of tea. But immediately he realized the words that the girl across from him had said, and he spat out all the tea in horror at what he heard. He spat out all the tea right into Qian Feng Su, who was sitting across from him. Lin Yunfeng shouted, What did she mean? What other son? Qian Feng Su nonchalantly wiped her face with a handkerchief and asked the guy to calm down. But Lin Yunfeng was beyond angry, slapped the table so hard that it cracked, and questioned the woman. What kind of joke was she playing? He reminded her that aside from a few battles, they had no friendships or relationships. He didn't understand how they could have had a son. Just then, Lin Yunfeng remembered that humiliating incident. 
Qian Fang Sui read the memories in his eyes and said that he remembered everything correctly. She explained to him that it was that time that she had used it to neutralize the poison. Lin Yun Feng said that she had finally recognized it. He reminded her that they had many battles after that incident, and Chen Feng Shu acted as if nothing had happened between them. Lin Yun Feng confessed to her that after getting carried away, he had already started to think that he had gone crazy, and it was all a hallucination. Qin Feng Su asked him to calm down and told him that it wasn't his fault. But Lin Yun Feng continued to shout at the woman. He didn't understand how one could be calm after something like this. He had told her that all his life, he had treated women with equal respect and had never violated the norms of behavior. However, in his mind, Chan Feng Su had used him as a tool to deal with the poison. He added that she stole his virginity and left wagging her ass, slamming the door and not even thanking him. Qian Fang Su tried to listen to him, but in the end, she couldn't bear it. She abruptly stood up, slapped the table, and replied to him that if he wanted to shout even louder, then the entire Tao sect would know what they were talking about. Lin Yun Feng was struck by a flash of light. He covered his mouth with his hands in fear and looked around. Qian Fang Su asked him why he was so nervous after all, he hadn't done anything wrong. Lin Yun Feng lowered his hands from his mouth and said that Qian Fang Su had said everything right. After all, he hadn't made a mess of things, so there was no reason for him to be nervous. He crossed his arms over his chest and added that it wasn't his fault after all. Qian Fang Su replied that it was all her fault. She told Lin Yunfeng that all these years, she hadn't thought about who should be responsible for this, so she took it all on herself. Just then, Lin Yunfeng asked the woman to stop. She asked him what was the matter. Lin Yunfeng replied that he needed to calm down a bit first. He took the teapot and began pouring tea straight from the spout into his mouth. After getting drunk, he put the teapot on the table and proposed to Qian Fang Su, since that was the case, to get married. Qian Fang Su couldn't believe her ears and asked Lin Yun Feng to repeat what he said. Lin Yun Feng tossed the stone, clenched his fist, and in the same instant, the stone turned into a shining diamond ring. He told Qian Fang Su, although they didn't love each other, Having children together obliges them to get married, and asked her to set a date for the wedding. But Chen Fang Shu rejected his offer and said that Lin Yun Feng was mistaken. She replied that she had no intention of marrying him. Lin Yun Feng lost his temper again. He shouted again, why was she bullying him like that? Why then did she come to him and tell him that they had a son? She was about to say something back to him, but then she got up from her chair, walked over to him, leaned in as if she wanted to say something in his ear. At this moment, Lin Yunfeng turned around and noticed that his lips were next to hers. He didn't understand what she wanted. After meeting each other's gaze, they turned away from each other, and Chen Feng Shui left for her seat. After that, Lin Yunfeng stood up from the table, coughed, and said that he needed to think about it. He promised to give her an answer in a few days. He walked out from under the canopy, and at this moment, Chuan Feng Shu asked him to wait. Lin Yun Feng stopped and asked, what did she want to say? Chuan Feng Shu asked him that he so easily believed that they had a son, despite her telling him about it completely out of the blue. Lin Yun Feng replied to her that their first meeting he had left quite a few bad impressions of her. He remembered her as a self-centered and ill-mannered brute. Hearing this, Chuan Feng Shu took hold of the table cover. Lin Yunfeng added that the way she had shown herself during the battles, her bravery in the face of the enemy made him rethink his opinion of her. He admitted that he admired Kian Feng Su. And then goosebumps ran across Kian Feng Su's skin. It was as if she had been possessed by something. Lin Yunfeng told the woman that sometimes he even thought about becoming her non-blood brother. Suddenly, Kian Feng Su's right eye flashed red, and she smiled heavily. She screamed that no one would want to be his brother and threw a teapot at his back. The woman missed and Lin Yunfeng flew up and told her in farewell that in that case, they would see each other in a few days. The evil Chan Feng Sui stayed under the canopy and Lin Yunfeng flew back to his home. There was a full moon. Lin Yunfeng was thrashing around in the sky, 
holding his head and trying to comprehend what had happened. He couldn't believe that he had a son. Suddenly, he felt a heartbeat. In his thoughts, he said that he had elevated his mind to the state of an ancient well whose water reflected the sky. The thousands of powerful enemies beside him would not make him tremble. He didn't understand why his heart was pounding so hard right now. Lin Yunfeng decided that he needed to fight someone to calm down. Lin Yunfeng decided to change the direction of his flight, turned around and flew in the other direction. He flew towards the demonic sect's heavenly palace. The guards of the heavenly palace noticed the sage and ordered them to sound the alarm. Lin Yunfeng noted that the alarm was too slow. He used the lion's roar ability, which briefly stunned the guards. He shouted that he was challenging Yi Huang Huang to a fight. Suddenly, the demonic key went up in smoke. A girl flew out from the heavenly palace towards Lin Yunfeng. It was a beautiful person with dark pink hair and wearing a black dress with dark translucent sleeves. She flew up to him and placed her palm on his chest. Lin Yunfeng told her that she was evolving and added that there were few people in the world who could make him use even 20% of his body strength. The girl called him an arrogant bastard. Lin Yunfeng explained to her that he was annoyed and wanted to fight. The girl flew off to the side and told the man to attack her. And then they met in an aerial duel. The guards below watched their battle and did not understand why the sage had come to them again. Were they not done with war? Others wondered if they had somehow messed with him again and the sage had found out about it. Someone suggested that maybe the head had broken through in strength and decided to try out his powers for a fight with the sage. The other guard replied to the one who suggested that he was a fool who had not seen the amazing power of the sage who that year had killed ten great heads of the demonic sect in one move. He urged the other guards to pray that the sage would not get angry, for he could destroy the place to the ground. The guards did not understand what was the point of such a struggle. Was the sage succumbing to the head? Another replied that the sage had not even exerted himself yet. He urged everyone to be obedient and pray. Meanwhile, Lin Yunfeng and Yi Huang Huang were still fighting in the air. Later, their fight was over. They sat on the edge of the roof of the Sky Palace and drank sodas from tin cans. The soda dripped down the girl's lips and down her neck and onto her chest. The girl exhaled in relief and wiped her lips. She turned to Lin Yunfeng and asked why her brother would take out his anger on her every time something bothered him. She told him that her fragile body might not be able to take it. Lin Yunfeng replied to her that unlike her, he rarely came and didn't complain, and before, she was always chasing after him and trying to capture him. He added that looking back at the entire Celestia, only fighting her was able to cheer him up. The girl smiled and said that he was also the only one in the world who fought her like a man, and everyone else showed unnecessary softness. Lin Yunfeng tapped Yi Huang Huang on Yi Huang Huang's shoulder and remarked that they were like true friends. The girl lifted her feet above the abyss and wondered who else in this world could have alarmed the invincible sage. Yi Huang Huang took another can of soda and said that she was very curious. Lin Yunfeng hung his head and took a deep breath. He told the girl that without any warning and without any mental preparation, he suddenly had a son, also with that Kuan Fangsu. Yi Huang Huang spat out all the soda right into her brother's face out of sheer surprise. For that, she apologized to him and explained that she couldn't help herself. Lin Yunfeng wiped his face, then jumped up and declared that he didn't know anything about it. He explained that it happened shortly before when he was practicing. His sister listened to his excuses and laughed. Suddenly, a childish voice rang out behind Lin Yunfeng's back. He turned around and saw a little girl. She was very similar to Yi Huang Huang. The girl looked at Lin Yunfeng with tears in her eyes and shouted for him not to hurt her mom. Then, the girl pounced on Lin Yunfeng with her fists, calling him a scumbag and demanding that he stay away from her mother. The girls punched Lin Yunfeng's chest with her fists, but he didn't feel her blows at all. He turned to his sister, pointed his finger at the girl, and asked Yi Huang Huang when she had time to have a child. 
Lin Yunfeng said that if he had known about it, he would have sent her a gift. Lin Yunfeng looked at the girl and said that this little girl was very cute, while guarding her mother so jealously. He added that it was a true miracle in such a cold-blooded and heartless world. The sister asked the sage if he really thought as he said he did. These words stabbed Lin Yunfeng painfully. The girl then took out a blade and started poking Lin Yunfeng with it. And then he experienced physical pain as well. Lin Yunfeng looked at the blade in the girl's hands and immediately recognized it. It was an immortal destroying spike. He took the girl by the collar of her dress and lifted her up on his outstretched arm. Lin Yunfeng said that this toy, the name referring to the spike, was not for children. The girl screamed even harder, demanding that the wise man let her go and stop bullying her mom. Yi Huang Huang, looking at this, only laughed. Lin Yunfeng snatched the thorn from the girl's hands and said that she could have injured herself with such a thing if she wasn't careful. Suddenly, something inside the spike snapped and a multitude of shark needles came out of its handle. Lin Yunfeng dropped the spike from his hand in pain. He started yelling at the girl, but at the same time, she threw a certain balloon right into his mouth. After accidentally swallowing the balloon that his sister's daughter threw at him, Lin Yunfeng straightened up and said that not even a hundred poisons could poison him. Suddenly, he felt an unbearable bitterness inside. He felt sick to his stomach. He grabbed his throat and barely squeezed out a question, what kind of toy was this? Yi Huang Guang replied that her daughter had gotten it from the five poisonous children, a pill of five flavors. It was not very poisonous, but it was unbearably unpleasant. Lin Yunfeng was so bitter that his eyes popped out of his orbits and his face turned blue. His mouth was all knitted. After suffering through it, he told the girl that her uncle was angry and that children shouldn't be doing things like that. Lin Yunfeng was very bitter. He even stuck out his tongue. That's when he saw the soda cans off to the side of him. Lin Yunfeng opened two at once and drank to his heart's content, chasing away the bitterness in his mouth. Afterwards, Lin Yunfeng asked his sister who was the father of this girl. Lin Yunfeng wanted to teach him a lesson for bringing up his daughter, who seemed terribly stubborn and disobedient. Yi Huang Huang replied to Lin Yunfeng that it was his daughter. Lin Yunfeng didn't expect such a turn of events. Being completely bewildered, he spat out the soda he had been drinking while he and his sister were talking and hit his sister's face again. Yi Huang Huang wiped her face with her hand, then waved her hand and moved her daughter home with the power of telekinesis. She replied to her brother that she would explain it to him later. Lin Yunfeng was no longer sure that everything that had happened to him had actually happened. He suddenly decided that it was all his auditory hallucinations, which were caused by the fact that, as he explained to himself, he had not drunk soda, but Baltica 9. At this, Yi Huang Huang suggested that he take a few more sips to cheer himself up. She handed him a can of a stronger drink, and Lin Yunfeng took it. He pulled on the key, and after the jar quietly whispered something inaudible, greedily began to gulp down its contents. One can was not enough. After ten cans, Lin Yunfeng finished drinking and burped. He asked his sister again, who was the girl's father. She answered him the same as before. Lin Yunfeng started shaking her as hard as he could and shouted that nothing had happened between them. He believed that she was lying to him. The girl replied to him that he had indeed forgotten everything. She began to tell him that over a decade ago, when she was still a heavenly palace saint, his newly formed divine power had gotten out of control. Lin Yunfeng had slaughtered many demonic sect masters and forced the demons who fought singly to unite against him. She remembered that these scoundrels used every dirty trick in the book. Wave after wave of intrigues, poisonings, sieges, battles of attrition. It was a war of attrition. Dozens of days of continuous poisoning by poison, sudden assaults between battles, continuous secret assassinations, persecution. Quickly formed attributes to subdue puppets in a war of attrition. She recounted that after Lin Yunfeng was caught, he was put in chains, and the forces of both sides returned to a state of rivalry. Many prophesied that from this point on, God would kill God, Buddha would destroy Buddha.
Those crafty and cunning guys became even more ambitious and wanted to dominate the world, and so began the Great War. Lin Yunfeng asked her how was this possible. He recalled that he had been locked up in a hellish prison where he had almost thrown off his skates. The girl ran her finger over his nose and replied that fate had indeed favored him, which was why he had survived. He said she was the only one who dared to behave like that to him. She walked closely to Lin Yunfeng and asked him, so who made her a dimness? He gently pushed her away and asked her to keep the conversation closer to the case, as he had no time for this. And she continued the story. At that time, she was cultivating the White Maiden technique, the moon of the underworld. Lin Yunfeng told her that he knew that this was a unique technique of her demonic sect, capable of linking all the techniques of others with her own body, and it was even more powerful than the divine North Sea technique found in legends. Therefore, her sect had produced many great demons. Since she was also able to multiply the power of others, she became known as a great omnipotence technique. And the lust to possess this technique ruined her sect. The girl said that he had made a good point. She said that after the five ancient demons captured Lin Yunfeng, their plans changed and they joined forces to form a conspiracy against her. They were frantically trying to divide all of her magical power equally, and then in one fell swoop they would divide all of China. Lin Yunfeng was so angry at this story that he clutched the tin can in his hand. Then he with his power melted it in his hand, and afterwards turned it into a multicolored gem. He said that the ancient demons were cunning and duplicitous. They weaved intrigues, broke traditions, and strayed from the true path. They made him endure many humiliations. The longer Lin Yunfeng thought about them, the angrier he became. He wanted to kill them, so he asked where were they hiding. But the beautiful woman snuggled up to him again, embraced him, and told him not to be so hot. She told him that if he could see them now, he would not be so angry. Lin Yunfeng shifted his gaze to his interlocutor and asked, What happened to them? She told Lin Yunfeng that the thousand-armed demon Buddha Wai had been in seclusion for ten days after Lin Yunfeng had destroyed all of his cultivation in one fell swoop. It was said that he had returned to the path of truth. He began to travel to the Holy Land to atone for the sins he had committed. Lin Yunfeng added that he thought that Guy was a Buddhist and clearly understood the Buddhist teachings. She asked how come he became a demon. Lin Yunfeng said that he couldn't kill him now that he was done with the bad deeds. An honorable demon of Yin Mountain, he ruled over thousands of demon kings of the underworld and considered himself the best in the world, but Lin Yunfeng killed 3,000 evil demons with a single strike of his sword of pure Yang power. The Yin Mountain Demon had been so scared to death that his mind had become clouded, and he was now being treated in the intensive care ward of a mental hospital. The girl told Lin Yunfeng that there were several others besides these two. But he didn't want to happen anymore. He was agreeing that he had managed to forget about everything. Lin Yunfeng never thought that their lives would change so much. His interlocutor took the gem from his hand and said that Lin Yunfeng had become more and more terrifying ever since he entered the Taiyi realm, turning the jar into a rare seven-colored illusionary gem with his own hands. She said a lot of women would go crazy if he used it to pick up the fairer sex. Lin Yunfeng asked her not to change the topic and continue the story. Afterwards, the demons organized a scam together they drugged her with the world's most powerful aphrodisiac, dispelling the scorching sun in an attempt to cloud her mind. But she did not submit so easily and escaped at the risk of her life. Her body was severely poisoned, she knew she couldn't live on the run for the rest of her life. She made a different decision then, knowing that her cultivation would be taken away from her anyway. She snuck into the dungeon where Lin Yunfeng was being held and used the portal to sneak into his cell. She used the soul-sealing technique on Lin Yunfeng and performed the act of coitus. Lin Yunfeng began to shake the girl violently again and asked why she chose him. After all, they and she were as incompatible as fire and water. She replied that she only did it because he was handsome.
Lin Yunfeng stated that this was utter nonsense. He pointed out that if anything, that thousand-armed guy was known to be the most handsome among both the good and evil ones. Although he was both a Buddhist and a demon, his temperament amazed everyone and everything. She asked him, so what? Lin Yingfeng demanded to tell him the truth. The girl laughed and said that he knew himself well after all. She replied that she had actually thought about it a lot too. As a result, it was her choice that made her who she was now, the supreme head of the demonic sect. She said that if she hadn't chosen him, she probably would have died a long time ago. Lin Yunfeng admitted that she had indeed tricked him, but for all that, he really did treat her like a little sister. He accepted her truth. After that, Lin Yunfeng approached the girl, took her hand with one hand, turned it palm upwards, and took the illusory stone with the other. He then used his magic on the stone. Suddenly, a bright flash appeared for a moment, and after it, a wedding ring lay in Lin Yunfeng's palm. He presented her with a ring and asked them to marry. The girl took the ring and said that she would keep it as it was very beautiful, but she refused to marry Lin Yunfeng. Lin Yunfeng became angry again and asked her, what was the matter? She replied that was the point. Lin Yunfeng was angered by such a response, saying that it was as if he and Qian Fangsu had colluded. Both of them just said no so easily. Yi Huang Huang asked, what reason did Qian Fangsu use to reject him? Lin Yunfeng replied that Qian Fangsu was afraid that once the child was branded as the son of a sage, he would be isolated from others, and since the world was only stabilizing, its morals unstable, the child might become a target for enemies who harbored a grudge against Lin Yunfeng. Yi Huang Huang replied that Qian Fangsu was right. Lin Yunfeng had to face many problems in the future. Although Lin Yunfeng was the most powerful person in the world, forcefully restoring order in the celestial realm, but there were still three immortals, four wisdoms, five clans, and eight groups of great masters, and they were all in hiding. Many of them were eager to take the place of the invincible sage. The Rakshasas ruled in the west, and the Manas ruled in the south, and the Hanli ruled in the north. In the east across the ocean, there was a federation that called itself the Heavenly Kingdom. It controlled the neighboring countries of the Eastern Sea. They were all hungry for spiritual abundance. Yi Tuang Huang sat down and told Lin Yunfeng that he still had many battles to fight, and children would be his weakness. Lin Yunfeng asked her, but would it be safe here where all the enemies, true path changers, and notorious demons were hiding? Yi Huang Huang replied to Lin Yunfeng that he didn't have to worry about it, as she wasn't called evil doom for nothing. Even old men were afraid of her. Even Lin Yunfeng himself was getting a beating from her. Sitting down next to the girl, he decided to ask her about the girl. In his opinion, she was so cunning at such a young age. He wondered if her mother was worried about the girl's future. Yi Huang Huang replied that she used to be a witch who devastated the world. She asked Lin Yunfeng, why didn't he worry about her? The boy wanted to answer the question, but she put her finger on his lips and prevented him from saying a word. The girl asked him to remember the ideals he had fought for in the beginning. Yi Huang Huang called herself a vice who had never been interested in peace and harmony. But now, a different way of life didn't seem so bad to her. A dull pain entered Lin Yunfeng's heart. He clutched his chest. He stated that having children with two such women was too much for his heart. The girl laughed and said he should get used to it sooner rather than later. Lin Yunfeng, surprised by such words, asked Yi Huang Huang, why should he get used to this? She replied to him that Hu Kexen's fox had also borne him a daughter. Immediately, a look of horror froze on Lin Yunfeng's face and cold sweat poured down his entire body. He shouted, not believing what Yi Huang Huang told him. After that, he immediately flew away. Yi Han Huang sat on the edge of the roof and looked at the trail of Lin Yunfeng flying away in the rook and said to herself that it was getting more and more interesting. Meanwhile, knocked out and in a panic, Lin Yunfeng flew through space. He didn't believe what Yi Huang Huang told him. He conceded that he had contacted the fox to establish a diplomatic alliance with Kunlin. He could remember absolutely nothing. 
Suddenly he stopped in midair as he grasped the thread of the right memory in his head. Twelve years ago, there was a period when China was competing for the Five Pearls. The great country of Rakshasa in the west was about to expand to the east. The first step was to send the fifth prince Bai Yi to Kunlun, the land of all demons, which is the gateway to the southwest of China, in order to marry the great emperor Rakshasa and the nine-tailed demoness Hu Kexin. Lin Yunfeng, as China's envoy, was entrusted to go to Kunlun alone. That day, he killed the fifth crown emperor with a single sword stroke. The world shuddered. Lin Yunfeng stood in the main hall of day with a bloody sword in his hand. The breathless body of the emperor was lying next to him. The emperor's counselor came running. Seeing his emperor dead, he shouted that this was the end. He couldn't believe that Lin Yunfeng could do such a thing. Suddenly, a silhouette appeared behind the curtains of the hall. A female voice was heard saying that Bei Yi, the fifth crown emperor of the great Rakshasa, had been pierced by Lin Yunfeng's sword. She didn't think that the great country of Rakshasa would envy them, a small country of demons, so she went along with the deal. She asked, what did China want them to do? Lin Yunfeng replied that the demon country had nothing to fear, he wasn't going to fight. He said that the Rakshasa had sent Bai Yi to demonstrate their power. They wouldn't go to war right now because of the messenger's death. There was clapping. Behind the curtains, women's hands slammed against each other. The female voice noted that Lin Yunfeng was not only excellent in martial arts, but also possessed wisdom and courage on top of that. Lin Yunfeng thanked the stranger for the compliment. A woman's voice from behind the curtains continued that the Rakshasa was unlikely to come to them with troops, but if they got angry, they would force her to submit to them. She asked what should she do in that case. Superficially, the Rakshasa is united, but in reality, there is infighting going on inside, they will not stand for war. Lin Yunfeng added that it would be better for them to stay away from this place. Lin Yunfeng's sword lit up with a blue color. He let go of the sword, and it flew and slammed into the emperor lying on the floor. The girl behind the curtains asked Lin Yunfeng, how were they different from the Rakshasa? Through the translucent fabric, a female silhouette could be seen standing up and taking a few steps forward. And then a beautiful girl with waist-length white hair, with fox ears on her head, wearing a white dress and bare feet, came out from behind the curtains. She also had a little fluffy tail. Lin Yunfeng was stunned by her beauty. She came up to him and said that, after all, they were a small country sandwiched between large countries. To keep the peace, they had to bow, pay tribute, obey. She asked Yunfeng which of the above they were supposed to do for his country, or were they supposed to do everything for them at once. He replied to her that all they wanted from them was friendship. Such an answer surprised the girl. Lin Yunfeng told her that they wanted to help each other in trouble, to coexist peacefully, to be equal. After he said that, the girl laughed. Lin Yunfeng asked her, why is she laughing? Choking with laughter, she asked him to take his time, to let her catch her breath and comprehend his words. After a while, the girl exhaled and placed her hand on Lin Yunfeng's sword hilt. She told him she wanted to ask him for a suckling before he left. Suddenly, the fox girl flashed her eyes. A pink light reflected in Lin Yunfeng's pupils. Lin Yunfeng awakened from his memories soaring high in the sky under the full moon. He recalled that the next day, after the events described, he returned. However, what had happened all that time, he did not remember. He could not remember what had happened. He scratched his head and concluded that thinking, guessing, and reasoning were not his fort. He solved all questions by doing. After decades of fighting to the death, after so many plots against him, Lisa still found a way to outwit him. He wanted to force Lisa to tell him the truth. Lin Yunfeng was already imagining her begging for forgiveness, pleading with him and saying that she would do anything for him. He flew like a comet to realize his plan. The sage was so thoroughly confused that he had completely forgotten the purpose of this trip. The action moved to the main hall of the Dayu. The guards announced the arrival of a special envoy from Rakshasa. Lin Yunfeng looked out from around the corner and, watching from the sidelines, 
thought that she had a meeting with another state preparing. Lim Yunfeng was hiding around the corner and reasoned, could he now angrily walk up to this ruinous woman, poke his finger on her nose, and ask at the top of his voice, why was he hiding? He started pacing around as he didn't know what he was supposed to say. He would ask Hu Kexin what she did to him then. He would ask her to tell him the truth. But this way of putting it seemed harsh to him. A child's voice sounded behind Lin Yunfeng's back. The child asked his daddy what was he doing here? Without turning around, he calmly replied that he was here to bother that seductive witch Hu Kexin. Dithi asked him again why he decided to bother his mom. Lin Yunfeng already wanted why. He decided to bother Hu Kexin, but then it hit him. He turned around and saw a little girl with fox ears and tail, with pink hair and wearing the same pink dress. She was holding a doll that looked remotely like Lin Yunfeng. The girl smiled at Lin Yunfeng and called him daddy. He exhaled and took a breath. Then the realization of the girl's words came to him. He looked at her with wide eyes, and, unable to contain himself, shouted a question about what the girl had just said. The guards heard his shout and announced the invasion of the enemy. A crowd of warriors ran toward the side temple. Lin Yunfeng noted that this was the worst way to appear. He was not allowed to start a war with a friendly nation. He pressed his palms together and applied the yin and yang reversal ability. Reversing yin and yang is one of the ten unrivaled loss techniques cultivated by Lin Yunfeng after he entered the Taiyi realm of supreme purity. Its possessor is able to rewind all time and space back 30 seconds. A loss technique that once brought defeat to countless powerful enemies. Now he was using her in a similar way. He turned time and space back 30 seconds. Lin Yunfeng was once again hiding behind the side temple from the guards. Again, the girl called him daddy. Lin Yunfeng was glad that he possessed such a useful ability. He stroked the girl's head and told her that daddy shouldn't yell for no reason. He asked her who her parents were, and then added that it was dangerous to run around the imperial court of great luminaries like that. The girl reasoned that the same seductive witch that Lin Yunfeng was talking about was his mom, and he was her dad. He smiled at the girl and told her she had gotten it right. Suddenly, the girl screamed at the top of her voice. The guards heard her shout and announced the invasion of the enemy. A crowd of warriors ran to the side of the temple. Lin Yunfeng grabbed his head and shouted that this was the worst way to appear. He was not allowed to start a war with a friendly state. He applied the reversal of yin and yang again. He turned time and space back 30 seconds. Lin Yunfeng, exhausted from reusing his lost ability, stood on all fours in front of a little girl holding a doll that looked a lot like him. For Lin Yunfeng, this was all happening too suddenly. He was afraid that he might go completely crazy like this. He had never had to fight children before. He didn't know what he should do next. Tired and covered in sweat, Lin Yunfeng rose from his knees and asked the girl if her mother had really told her that he was her father. The girl confirmed this and was glad that her father had finally come to see her. She told him that for twelve whole years, ever since she was a child, she had waited day and night for his coming on the roof of the throng room. The girl showed Lin Yunfeng her doll that looked remotely like him. She said that yesterday she had seen a shooting star in the night sky and made a wish, hoping that her father, like a great hero, would come down from the sky and save them. The girl admitted that she didn't even expect her wish to come true. Scant tears flowed from Lin Yunfeng's eyes. The girl had waited for him for twelve years. It was as if she was telling the truth. Standing in front of this innocent child who longed for his daddy, he had guilt and terrible remorse. Unable to hold back his tears, Lin Yunfeng kneeled down, spread his arms, and offering the girl daddy's embrace, apologized and declared that daddy had returned. The girl immediately told Lin Yunfeng that he had to save her and her mom. Lin Yunfeng asked her what had happened. The girl told him that the ambassador of the great Rakshasa had arrived. He was demanding tribute from the great kingdom of Yu, and yesterday they had unexpectedly sent a letter proposing marriage to her mother. The girl added that apart from this, Emperor Rakshasa wanted her to marry his third prince.
Lin Yunfeng said that this old man Rakshasa continued to carry out his dastardly schemes. It was the same thing year after year. He said that at a time when their state was still in the process of rebuilding, old man Rakshasa was again causing them problems. He not only laid his eyes on that cunning vixen, but also on her daughter. Lin Yunfeng motioned for the girl to come with him. She asked him where they would go. Lin Yunfeng replied, deciding to intervene and teach these Rakers henchmen a lesson. The girl hugged her father and said that he could really be relied upon. Lin Yunfeng decided that it was his time to act like a real father. He took the little girl in his arms and asked her to hold on tight. Lin Yunfeng pushed off from the ground and, like a rocket, soared into the sky with his daughter in his arms. Meanwhile, in the throne room of the great kingdom of Yu. In front of Hu Kexin, who was seated on the throne, there were two people, a messenger with a thin mustache and a purple headscarf, and a man wearing a black cloak that half hid his face. The messenger addressed the honored queen of the great kingdom of Yu. He conveyed to her from his master that the time had expired and asked if she was ready to give an answer to the request for a marriage between the second prince of the great kingdom of Rakshasa and the princess of the great kingdom of Yu. Hu Kaxin replied to him that her child was too young and not of marriageable age. She said that she was willing to discuss her daughter's marriage when she was older. The messenger told her that his wise master, the ruler of Rakshasa, had already taken this matter into consideration for the queen, so it was worth taking the princess to the sacred capital for a better education and to get closer to the second prince. The messenger added that when she reaches marriageable age, they will have a grand wedding that the whole world will know about. Hu Kaxin replied that she only had one daughter, and that she would feel bad if she was too far away from her. The messenger reassured her, telling her that it would be no problem, as the king had thought of everything in case she didn't want to part with her daughter. The king had already sent a teacher to take care of the princess education first. Hu Kaxin said that although her country was a small border state, there was no shortage of eroded people. She added about the teacher that the king didn't have to bother with that. The messenger asked her if there was anyone in her country who could compare with the famous teacher his king had taken the trouble to prepare for the princess. And at that moment, the black cloak of the man who stood next to the messenger began to be covered with green tongues of flame. A large shadow of a demon with a sword in his hand fell from the man to the floor. Hu Kaxin asked the envoy, who was it? The messenger answered her that this was the first apprentice of the mentor king of the great kingdom of Rakshasas, known as the Dark Lord of Life and Death, Sage Anu Green. Now he bore the name, Exhaling Death. Mundrek had thrown off his black cloak and now stood before them in a beautiful blue robe. His face was stern and unruffled. His long gray hair fell from his head to his shoulders. Anudis Green said in his sinister voice that he had never taken on an apprentice in his life, but Her Highness, the princess of the great kingdom of Yu, was incredibly talented. He said that he had verified it yesterday, and she was capable of inheriting his magic. After saying those words, Anudis Green's eyes lit up with a poisonous green color. The messenger asked the queen if she would now refuse the courtesy of the king of Rakshasa. Hu Kaxin replied to the envoy that it was not an easy decision for her, so she asked to be given time to think it over well. Suddenly, someone's voice replied to Hu Kaxin that there was nothing to think about and that the princess already had a teacher. Unhappy with this statement, envoy and Anu Green turned around. The envoy shouted, who was the princess's teacher. Lin Yunfeng stood in the throne room, holding Hu Kaxin's daughter in his arms. Hu Kaxin herself didn't expect to see Lin Yunfeng, but still greeted him with her warm smile. She stood up from her throne and asked, who was this Yu Kingdom princess teacher who broke into her great kingdom's palace without notice or following the rules? Hu Kaxin descended from the throne pedestal and then walked over to Lin Yunfeng holding her daughter. After that, she pressed her hand to her chest, bowed and greeted the sage. And then she asked what had brought him here and why hadn't he warned her of his visit. And then it came to the messenger and Anutis Green that the very same omnipotent sage stood before them. The messenger asked Anutis Green what they should do. He added that there were rumors that the sage had united the divine state 
and no one could defeat him. Anudis Green asked, how did the sage have time for such trivialities when he should be dealing with the problems of the divine state and continuing to stabilize it? Anunis Green stated that Lin Yunfeng was lying in order to prevent him from taking the princess as his apprentice. The messenger completely agreed with Green and added that even if they wanted to send a message, the sage wouldn't be able to arrive so quickly. Hu Kaxin glanced at the envoy and Anutis Green, then turned to Lin Yunfeng and asked him if she and the sage were soulmates, or if he missed her and had secretly come to visit her, or had he come to watch her take a bath in the morning. The girl jumped from Lin Yunfeng's arms, ran up to her mother, and hugged her. Hu Kaxin asked her daughter why she had brought the sage to them. Lin Yunfeng walked past Hu Kexin and whispered to her that she, the cunning vixen, had learned how to use him to her advantage quite well. She replied to him that her guests from the kingdom of Rakshasa did not believe that he was the very sage. Anudis Green said that the sage was the first person of the divine state, trying to stop him would be foolish. He told Lin Yunfeng that if he was impersonating the revered sovereign of the eastern kingdoms, it was a very serious offense. Anudis Green asked to be allowed to test Lin Yunfeng for authenticity. The girl told Hu Kexin that this old man was as cunning as they come. With that excuse, if he won or lost, he still wouldn't hurt anyone. After that, Anudis Green began to conjure. The throne room plunged into darkness. Anudis Green let a black drop fall from his finger, which fell to the floor and dissolved, turning into a black portal. From this portal rose a skeleton in a black cloak and with a scythe in his bony hands. Hu Kaxin knew this spirit summoning technique. It was the technique of summoning the spirit of the laws of the world. The messenger said that there were only a few great sages in this world to whom the gods had bestowed the power of laws, and the god of death, who is responsible for the power over life and death, stands out even among the gods. No attack was effective against him, for it was the reaper of all things. Anudis Green asked the sage to show him his true power. The girl trembled. She said it was getting very cold, but she didn't understand what was wrong. Lin Yunfeng placed his hand on the girl's head and transferred his energy to her, causing her to warm up quickly. He asked her if everything was okay now. The girl replied that she was no longer cold. Meanwhile, Anudis Green sent a reaper to attack Lin Yunfeng. Lin Yunfeng asked Anudis Green if he had heard anything about the hidden teachings of the East's incarnation of the gods. Immediately, a bright light began to emanate from Lin Yunfeng. A huge multi-armed Buddha suddenly appeared in front of the reaper. Lin Yunfeng said, this was the true incarnation of God right here, and then added that he was the god. The messenger and Anutis Green could not believe their eyes. They opened their mouths and instantly drenched themselves in sweat. Divine Buddha swatted the reaper like a small mosquito with his hands. From that clap, a shockwave rippled around the area, nearly knocking down everyone in the throne room. Another second, and there was no trace left of the magical summoned entities. Lin Yunfeng asked the envoy and Anutis Green to tell his master that although China was still stabilized, he would not allow him to expand his influence. The envoy and Anutis Green were now standing naked in front of Lin Yunfeng. It appeared that the shockwave had ripped off all their clothes. They replied that they understood Lin Yunfeng. After that, Lin Yunfeng told them to scram, and once they returned, they would have to find out how their prince had been mutilated 12 years ago. Lin Yunfeng waved his hand, and the envoy and Anutis Green flew out of the throne room. After that, Lin Yunfeng turned to Hu Kexin and his daughter and saw that their hair was standing on end after the shockwave. The little girl asked her mom if she had asked her dad to help them. Hu Kexin replied that she did not know. She did not understand how the sage could have known that a Rakshasa ambassador had suddenly arrived. Afterward, the girl began to jump joyfully, and told her mother that it had come to her that she had found her father. She asked her mother, wasn't Lin Yunfeng really her father? Hu Kexin replied to her daughter that she was right. The little girl screamed with joy and gave her mom a high five. She was glad she had finally found her daddy. 
Afterward, she ran up to her mother and told her that her daddy was handsome, naive at that, but still pretty cool. The daughter asked how the mother met him. Lin Yunfeng asked, what were the mother and daughter whispering about? Hu Kexin stated that it was destiny, after which she stroked her daughter's head. Ta started to make like she understood what her mother meant, but really didn't understand a damn thing. Lin Yunfeng asked Hu Kexin and her daughter not to pretend like he wasn't here. He asked them what was wrong with them. Hu Kexin replied to him that she expected him to be more gentle with her. She said that she was wearing a single dress made of white Japanese silkworm creep, and it had just been cut by Lin Yunfeng's released air current. She invited Lin Yunfeng into her chambers to keep her company while she changed her clothes. Then she took his hand and pulled him with her. The girl looked at her mom and dad, whom she saw together for the first time, which made her smile happily. Then she chased after them, yelling at them to wait for her. Later in the chambers of the Imperial Palace, Lin Yunfeng was standing in the middle of the bedroom, and his daughter was playing with a doll while lying on the bed. Hu Kexin, meanwhile, was changing her clothes behind a screen through which her silhouette was clearly visible. Lin Yunfeng stared at her, unable to take his eyes away. Still, he turned away so as not to be accused of peeping. And then the girl asked him why he didn't look at her mom, wasn't she beautiful? Lin Yunfeng rebuked his daughter for already thinking such a thing at such a young age. He told her that it was called respect. The girl said that any man who had seen her mother even once thought her beautiful. Lin Yunfeng asked his daughter, what did her mother teach her? The girl replied that her mother taught her to use all her charms to subdue her opponent, to use softness to overcome hardness, to agree when to say no, to use the carrot and stick method. Hu Kaxin's voice sounded behind Lin Yunfeng's back. He turned and saw her in a beautiful black dress. She looked very seductive. Lin Yunfeng asked Hu Kaxin, how could she teach a child like this? Hu Kaxin replied that her baby girl was growing very fast. She had already tamed a couple of wild and dangerous animals. Lin Yunfeng said that it was kind of absurd. He asked Hu Kaxin to explain to him how did this happen? She said that after reaching a certain age, her daughter immediately wanted to find her father, but Hu Kexin didn't help her do that. Lin Yunfeng immediately turned gloomy. He asked, was it shameful to have a great father? Hu Kexin replied that she made her daughter find out on her own. The girl said that she went through the foreign affairs directories of the Great Yu Kingdom and listed a list of all the possible people, and after checking one by one, her father was among them. But she admitted that she didn't expect her father to come to her on his own. Then she had an opportunity, she asked her father to come to help. Lin Yunfeng said that he understood everything. The essence of Hu Kexin's upbringing was to teach with an emphasis on moral qualities using games. Hu Kexin had told him that her daughter was the heir to the throne of the Great Yu Kingdom, so she needed to learn how to navigate around the great powers. It was a life skill and also a method of protecting himself and thousands of his subjects. Lin Yunfeng suggested his daughter not to become a princess, but to become an ordinary happy child. Hu Kexin replied to him that the world was still not so peaceful, and due to this, they had to bear this burden. Lin Yunfeng said that he wished peace not only for one country, but for the whole world. He added that he wanted his children to live without any worries, and then the girl suddenly declared that she did not want to become wise. To do that, you have to learn so many rules of propriety, memorize so much information about the relationships of the surrounding countries, and you could not slurp when you eat something tasty. Hu Kaxin told Lin Yunfeng that 12 years ago, she had taken his words as the ramblings of a young man. Now she looked forward to the day when his wishes would be fulfilled. Hu Kexin seductively walked over to the bed and lay down on it. Lin Yunfeng first admired her beauty and grace, and then remembered what question he wanted to ask her. Lin Yunfeng asked Hu Kexin, since she still hadn't told him what she had done to him, and why didn't he remember anything. The girl looked at her mother with frightened eyes, and asked her if she had used that technique on her daddy. Hu Kexin praised her daughter for being smart. Lin Yunfeng asked her, what kind of technique did she use on him? 
Hu Kexin said that her great Yu kingdom had been built over centuries, not only by cunning, but also by a strong progeny, friendly feelings and strength were of great importance. In second place were history and might. But basically, the kingdom was built by people who were talented, invincible, and exceptionally skilled in deception. They had comrades, families, or all sorts of things that bound them together. So if Hu Kexin didn't have the techniques to protect her family, she wouldn't have reached the current heights. The girl recounted how her mother told her that she was from a family of nine-tailed foxes. She had a charming face and an attractive body from birth. But the most important thing about a woman is her soul. It is a gift capable of enchanting all beings. It could only be used once in a lifetime. Those who were trapped could be manipulated at will. The girl asked her mother, more than a decade ago, her father was still far from the best masters of the time, so why did she choose him? Lin Yunfeng supported his daughter's question. He too wanted to hear why Hu Kaxin chose him. Hu Kaxin replied that it was the only time that someone sincere and brave had been able to charm her herself. After saying that, she laughed softly. Lin Yunfeng heard the answer, first embarrassed, then exhaled and sat on the floor with helplessness. Then he thundered and declared that the women were all the same, too dangerous. Hu Kaxin was outraged by this statement from Lin Yunfeng. She asked if all women were really the same. She questioned him, were there really others besides her and Yi Huang Huang? She asked him to tell them about it sooner. The girl got excited and said loudly that she wanted to hear her father's story too. Lin Yunfeng was stunned. He couldn't find the words to begin his story or even say anything to justify himself for a long time. An hour went by like that. Lin Yunfeng still managed to tell the family a little bit about his previous love affairs. When he finished his story, his daughter jumped up on the bed and said, since they had already both refused to marry her father, why don't mother and father get married first? Lin Yunfeng and Hu Kexin looked at each other cautiously, then shook their heads in sync and said that it was impossible for them to marry each other. The girl puffed up her cheeks of indignation and asked why. Lin Yunfeng replied that a marriage between the leaders of two states implied something more than a marriage between two people. The queen's marriage to him would be tantamount to joining the great kingdom of Yu to the divine state. The opposing forces in the great Yu kingdom would not allow this to happen, so there was a threat of civil war within the kingdom. Hu Kaxin patted her daughter on the head and added that it was all the more unacceptable to ask the sage to join, marry and stay in the great kingdom of Yu. China was just stabilizing, and the sage was a stabilizing force. The two of them had no choice. The girl hung her head, frowned, and asked unhappily, is that why she had to stay without her father when it was obvious she had found him? After saying that, the girl jumped on the bed and screamed that she hated them both. Hu Kaxin and Lin Yunfeng only looked at their child in a frightened manner. The girl ran away from the room in despair, leaving Lin Yunfeng and Hu Kaxin alone in the bedroom. Lin Yunfeng wanted to stop her, shouting at his daughter to wait and not run away, but then Hu Kaxin pulled him by the arm. Her face was unperturbed, still held a welcoming smile on her beautiful white face. She shook her head as if telling Lin Yunfeng that catching up with the girl was a futile endeavor. Lin Yunfeng didn't understand why she was doing all this. Hu Kaxin, looking at him with her big pink eyes, replied that since her daughter was born into the royal family, she had to go through this. Hu Kaxin said that it was like that for her, it was like that for her mother, and it would be like that for her daughter. She said she was more fortunate to have chosen a father for the child of her own free will. But Lin Yunfeng turned away from Hu Kexin and told her that a father should not stand aside in such a situation. He told Hu Kexin that he would think of something. Hu Kexin asked him to stay with her daughter before he left, for she was actually very happy about her father's return. Lin Yunfeng turned to Hu Kexin and asked her, how did she know that? Hu Kaxin replied to him that when they foxes were happy, their tail would unconsciously start wagging to the sides. Lin Yunfeng looked at Hu Kaxin's tails and noticed that they were waving to the sides. The girl, seeing that Lin Yunfeng had noticed this metamorphosis, became embarrassed herself, her cheeks immediately turning pink. 
In order not to show Lin Yunfeng her embarrassment, she began to cover her face with her velvet hands. Lin Yunfeng looked at her in surprise while asking Hu Kexin, was she happy? Hu Kexin replied that at this moment she was indeed, although a little bit, but she was still happy. Night has fallen. The street lights in the kingdom came on. In the palace, the lights in the rooms were turned on, making all the windows glow and illuminating the surroundings. The dark blue sky was dotted with bright burning stars, and a white full moon loomed among the sparse clouds. Hu Kexin's daughter was sitting on the roof of the palace, hugging her small knees with her arms, looking somewhere far away in the distance. Tears ran down her cheeks from her eyes. She realized that she was helpless in this situation and had no power to make her father and mother get married and live together. Suddenly, a stomping sound was heard behind her back. She turned around and saw Lin Yunfeng walking towards her on the tiles. The girl didn't want to talk to him, so she immediately turned her head aside as soon as Lin Yunfeng came over to her and sat down beside her. He looked at his daughter, trying to catch her gaze and start a conversation, but she didn't want to turn to him at all. Lin Yunfeng sitting up crawled closer to his daughter. She in turn immediately bounced away from him, while continuing to pretend as if she hadn't noticed him at all. Lin Yunfeng looked at his daughter. She was actively waving her little tails. This seemed like a very cute sight to Lin Yunfeng, and he smiled. He immediately recalled Hu Kexin's words telling him that when they foxes were happy, their tail would unconsciously start wagging to the sides. Lin Yunfeng decided to still start a conversation, and while still looking at his daughter with a smile, he apologized to her. The girl immediately turned to him, looked him in the eye, and asked him why he was apologizing. And after that, she added that adults had a lot of things they couldn't do anything about. She said that she was still a child, and so it was normal for her to not understand these adult things. The girl looked at her father with glittering eyes, as if expecting him to answer, while continuing to wag her ponytails. Lin Yunfeng thought that if it wasn't for the vixen's words about their tails, it would be difficult for him to understand his daughter's thoughts. Lin Yunfeng placed his hand on his daughter's head and began stroking the top of her head between her fluffy ears. The girl immediately exclaimed why he was the one to touch her head, since she still didn't know him well. She stated that he was her biological father, that's all. Lin Yunfeng wanted to comfort his daughter to somehow cheer her up. Lin Yunfeng told his daughter that he wanted to give her a gift for their first meeting, so he asked what she wanted. The girl immediately changed in her face, rejoiced, and asked her father if she could really wish for anything. Lin Yunfeng replied that she could have wished for anything. Then the girl poked her finger into the night sky and said she wanted a star. At that moment, a comet flew across the sky far, far above their heads, leaving behind a trail of its long and sharp tail. Lin Yunfeng looked at the sky full of glowing white stars and replied that he would arrange everything. Lin Yunfeng rose to his feet, stroked his daughter's head once more, and said that in that case, he would get one star for her, and after that, they would go home. And suddenly, the girl began to glow with a bright light, and then broke away from the roof with her feet and began to float in the air, flying higher and higher. Lin Yunfeng also took off and kept close to his daughter. The girl, being utterly at a loss for what was happening, shouted joyfully that she was flying. She flung her arms out to the sides and floated freely in the air, soaring higher and higher towards the night sky itself. Night! Yunfen and his daughter are hovering above the roof of a building. The little girl wants higher, even higher. The father agrees. They ascend high into the sky. The little girl is thrilled. Wah! This is the first time she sees the stars so close. Yunfen asks his daughter to look carefully. He is going to get the star. She is eagerly waiting. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. Young Fen stretches out his hand and casts an incantation, a mouth that can swallow the sun and moon. A hand that can pluck the stars. Moving stars, star come. The girl stares mesmerized. Wow. The star is approaching the planet at a tremendous speed. The people who see it think it's the end. They are finished. The star is falling. Watching this, Fox Hu Kexen smiles and thinks that the sage is still the same as always, plotting something grand. The little girl is afraid the star is about to crash, screaming to save them. The father calms her down. 
He tells her not to be afraid and to watch. He flies up to the star, stops its approach with his hand, and casts the incantation, Embrace Mount Sumeru, Maiden Grain. The star shrinks to the size of a small glowing pebble, which Yunfin gives to her daughter. The girl can't believe her eyes. It's a star. It's so beautiful. The father is happy that she likes it. The daughter waits her tail, but at the same time expresses her displeasure so the father doesn't think he can get her favor by giving her one star. The sage laughs. The little girl asks why. He explains her mom said the little girl wags her tail when she's happy. The little girl punches her father and screams that this is not true. She hates him. It took him so long to visit them, she and her mom were constantly bullied. The sage apologizes and says that if anyone bothers them again, the daughter can call to him using this star. He will come right away, even if he is ten thousand lie away from them. The girl wonders if this is true, is he not lying? Yunfeng confirms and adds that her father is very cool, also keeps his word. He takes his daughter in his arms and lifts her up by her armpits. The baby cheers and says she believes her father, who lifts her up by her armpits and holds her like this. They float in the air. The little girl sneezes. Apchi. Yunfen suggests they go back home, since they've already gotten the starfish. The daughter agrees. The girl sits on her father's forearm. They are flying. The sage says he still doesn't know her. The little girl interrupts and says her name is Xuangxuan. It's spelled with a U, he says her name. Xuangxuan. And says how beautiful, he'll remember it. Fu Kexin is waiting for them. Seeing her daughter and Yanfeng happily return, she starts to smile herself. The sage says it's getting late. Mother and daughter should rest. There are still important things to do in the country. He has to go now. Xuangxuan asks to visit her and her mom more often. Yunfeng agrees and offers to swear an oath. She and her daughter interlock their little fingers and swear to keep the promise for a hundred years, forever. The little girl says for it to count. The father must swear with the mother as well. The sage is confused. Hu Kexin holds out her little finger to him. The daughter rushes them. The parents' little fingers interlock. Hu Kexin asks what can and doesn't say, right? Yunfeng denies it must be said, otherwise how can it be called a vow? The daughter insists, say it, say it. The sage begins, they swear. The fox continues for a hundred years, and they say with one voice, forever and ever to keep the promise. The sage rises into the air, he and his daughter wave goodbye, flying. Yunfeng is happy, smiling. He 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 he. He 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 he. He 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 he. Suddenly, ah, God, he doesn't know what's wrong with him. He thinks he's losing his mind. He panics and grabs his head. Why is his heart in turmoil again? Sage stops in horror and holds his hands to his face. Deep breath, exhale. As the sage became a father for the first time, the unfamiliar feeling of warmth caused him to be overwhelmed with an experience he had never felt before, and he developed an outstanding new technique the absorption and eruption of heaven and earth. Yunfeng exhaustedly seemed to be hovering in the air and pondering. Damn, he could still feel the tension. He had children and from three absolutely impossible women at once. He wasn't prepared at all. What to do, what to do. Nerves. Suddenly, the sage slaps his forehead with the palm of his hand and an idea comes to him. We must find Wen Yufeng and consult with him. They call him a peerless counselor. He said he would do it. He flew to him at the speed of light. Very high up in the mountains, on the very edge of one of the cliffs, sits a hut. On the door is a sign that reads, Heavenly Chess House. A wise man stands looking at the door. He hesitates to approach the entrance, thinking about what he should say to this guy. Suddenly, the door opens. Yunfeng entered. The peerless counselor asks the sage standing at the threshold, doesn't he usually just break in? What's wrong? Yunfen is confused, not sure where to start. Then he hears the scrumptious food being prepared by the satisfied host. Wen invites the guest to come through and help himself. The sage sits down opposite, tastes the food, and tells the host that he seems to be the only one in the world who has thought of making a hot pot out of a more chessboard. Wen agrees, he has done all the calculations for China, and now he is in the realm of human calculus. 
This board is just for him to roast, drink, and play at his pleasure. Since ancient times, strategists have been able to work for their ideals, to work against the odds, to be resourceful and ingenious. But this guy raised the limits of the realm of strategy from the level of human schemes to the level of thorough astronomical calculations. The great art of calculus is the complete computation of the celestial mechanism. Man calculates yin, God calculates yang, but it is in the power of astronomical calculus to calculate all things to come. So all conspiracies and intrigues are defenseless against this inexhaustible power of calculation. But after such a calculation, he exhausted the power of his life and returned from the realm of astronomical calculations to the realm of human design. Yenfen recalls once telling the incomparable advisor that China was beginning to stabilize, they still had much to do. To which Wen replied that his celestial calculations end there, it was up to the sage and the brothers to take it from here. The peerless advisor found a hut and asked the sage to come and chat with him, business or no business. The host interrupts the guest's reminiscences with the question, why did he seek him out, and pours a drink. The wise man doesn't know what to say. It's silent. The incomparable counselor airborne passes the beverage-drinking pitcher and begins, Young Feng has a friend who has a problem. The sage catches the pitcher and with a cry of relief agrees. Yes, 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 that's right. When continues, is he in love, and he suddenly has a child, the sage agrees again. That's right, that's right. And then wonders, how does the owner of the hut know everything? Has he really entered the realm of astronomical calculus again? Wen says not quite, and asks the guest to tell him about his friend. Yunfeng exhales and tries to tell first about himself, then corrects himself and says that that one is his friend, was always too busy with work, and never socialized with the opposite sex. But nevertheless, he suddenly found out that he has children by several simply impossible women, and that friend doesn't know how he should proceed. Yunfen drinks a volley of his drink, puts the bowl on the table, and continues with a business-like look. That friend came to him for advice, but the wise man is also a bachelor. Therefore, how would he know? The incomparable counselor eats. With his mouth full, he says it looks like drama, even melodrama, magical realism, and asks the sage to keep telling. To which he replies, what's there to go on about? He can't help. Yunfen is visiting the incomparable counselor Wen. He goes on to tell him about his friend, who found out that he has children. Since the friend has asked the sage for help, he thinks he should do everything in his power. So he comes to the incomparable counselor and asks for some advice. The host puts down his chopsticks, stretches, and says sarcastically, Oh, look, our sage is a truly compassionate man. It seems that the world is not destroyed and people's lives are not ruined, but he is worried. The guest grabs his host by the pecs with one hand in a rage, pushes him against the wall, and breaks down into a scream. Wen must take into account, Yunfeng does not spare his life for his brothers, and if something happened to the peerless counselor, he would be just as worried. Wen calmly replies with a smile. Yes, 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 he perfectly represents the kindness and helpfulness of the sage. He asks to be released and says that his weak body can't take such a thing. Yunfeng calms down and agrees with his master. They sit down on the mats by the table. It's good that Wen realizes this. The sage impatiently asks him to hurry up and give some advice, so he can come back and share them. Wen begins to speak. Let's see, let's see, falls on the table, then bursts into loud laughter that can be heard even outside the hut. Laughed. Ha 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 After calming down a bit, says that she can't pretend anymore. Yunfeng is furious. Is this for the hut master to joke about? And warns that Wen is now asking for a beating. Wen clears his throat and calmly narrates. The sage knows that 15 years ago, he did 50 astronomical calculations for the only time in his life, right? The sage nods and asks why the peerless counselor is suddenly talking about this. Wen continues, he had once before told the sage that 50 astronomical calculations are a divine technique that calculates all possibilities, and that all human designs are inside astronomical calculations. Yunfeng says, aha, uh -huh. Wen continues. In fact, only those who have experienced it know the secret. 
What arises in the mind is not just arithmetic symbols and words, such as the nine palaces, the four circles, the sixteen trigrams, or the Ganji system. It is a real scene where one sees all the variations of events from the very beginning. Failures, almost failures, various possibilities for success. Yunfeng clarifies, various, when confirms and continues to narrate. Yes, various, yes. There was an ending in which he united the celestial empire and a sage died five years ago to save him. There was also an ending where the thousand armored one unified the demonic path and then forcefully plunged the nation into an abyss of calamity. All of China belonged to one man. Yunfeng cries out in surprise, is it that unbelievable? Then this is it now. Wen nods and continues, the sage's unexpected unannounced encounter with Kai and Fangsu, Yi Huangwang, Hu Xuangxuan, is the result of a certain future starting point he chose after the equation began. The sage was stunned, his jaw dropped. Snap. He yells at the incomparable counselor that he knew everything. The counselor corrects that he not only knew, but probably knew more than he did. Yun Feng pounces on Wen again, grabs him by the pecs with one hand, pins him against the wall, and asks in a rage why Wen didn't tell him sooner, and made him look bad. Wen calms his guest with a smile, easy, easy, his weak body can't take it. They sit down again on the mats by the table. The sage exhales. Who? Why does he get the feeling that Wen is the most powerful man in the world, and nothing can escape his grasp? Wen says that things are not at all as they seem to the sage, the sage is the one who is really powerful. Wen only made the choice, everything else is Yunfeng's own life, his feelings, his solid philosophy that led to this result. Yunfeng doesn't understand, then, why the peerless counselor didn't choose himself to unite the celestial empire. With his talent, the world would be a better place. Wen pours the wine and says, because in such an ending, no matter how you count, it wouldn't be as good as today, as they chat about life over wine and hot pot. Host and guest chug. Bottoms up. Wen and Yunfeng emptied their wine drinking bowls. Yunfeng exhaled. Phew. Since Wen knows everything, then surely the latter should know how to proceed. The peerless advisor shakes his head from side to side and replies, if he could calculate absolutely everything, he fears that his brain would have exploded long ago. His power of calculation has barely reached this point. The sage hopefully says, even if Wen can't calculate, with his intelligence we'll be able to help him and give him advice. Wouldn't he? Wen scratches the back of his head. If this was a war, he could still help strategize a bit. The problem was that, like the sage, he was too busy fighting. He didn't have time to chat about love, not to mention children. Yunfeng sighed. Okay. In the past, they went through all the dangers of war. Wen asks, how did they do it? The sage replies, of course, went forward despite the difficulties. Crushing and overcoming. The peerless counselor agrees. That's right. And says, if the sage were to think of the current situation as a dangerous battle, Yun Feng doesn't understand and interjects. A battle. But that's not the same thing, is it? Wen assures that they are no different. What was the sage afraid of? Accepting things as they are. So let's go. Yun Feng takes the bowl and looks at his reflection in the drink. Will it work? Wen says, in truth, the sage can only be in feed. Ken Fang Su, Yi Huang Wang, Lisa Hu Kexin, all these unique, stunning beauties, have had children with him. Isn't life starting to get interesting? Yunfeng floats in the air outside the hut. He and Wen wave goodbye to each other. Wen asks the sage to be ready to brave more surprises, to face more surprises. Go ahead, good friend. The wise man flies and reasons. Accepting things as they are, right, having gone through all that carnage, would he really fear such a thing? Stopping and floating in the lotus pose. As expected of a Yufing strategist, the sage has now calmed down. He continues to ponder. So, now that he is facing the battle as before, what should he do next? What should he do? What should he do? Suddenly, Yun Feng remembers the scorching sun powder. That's right. Scorching sun powder. That's the source of the problem. The first thing to do is to destroy this destructive stuff. The first priority is to avoid another tragedy. Then discuss with Chuan Fangshu about how to deal with his son's misfortune. 
then to discuss with Yi Huang Wang again about their daughter's education and future. Courtesy, respect your elders and love your juniors. Culture, find time to still visit Huxhuangxuan. Yun Feng snaps his fingers satisfied with himself. Perfect. Ha ha ha. Worthy of him. The roof of the sage city. Yun Fen is dozing on his throne. His brother arrives and asks why the sage called him here. The sage replies because he has a secret. The brother interjects. A secret. He loves secrets. The earth hearing court is already getting its hands itchy. Yun Feng orders his brother to go set the court in motion and find the strongest love potion, the scorching sun powder. The brother interjects in astonishment. Powder of scorching sun and wonders, since when has a sage been interested in these things, is he really going to? Yun Feng slaps his brother on the forehead. Are you making fun of the sage? Are you trying to get in trouble? Brother is down. It hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. He touches the bump on his forehead and apologizes. Yun Feng repeats the order, find the source of the scorching sun powder and put it on trial. It's a dangerous thing. It must be sealed. The brother says that the earth hearing court directly has information about the source of the scorching sun powder, but the sage interrupts, but what? The brother expresses his fears that the sage will have a hard time. Yun Feng continues to insist, this thing is a troubled time. The world is stabilizing. There is no need for it to exist. Otherwise, he doesn't know how many people will suffer again. A brother approaches and whispers in the sage's ear that this thing is produced by the Yi family. Yun Feng interjects. Yi, the Yi family? What is the Yi family? The brother raises his index finger up and explains in a business-like manner. Does the sage not realize what other Yi family? An old acquaintance of the sage who graciously sheltered him, a benefactor who gave him food. The one who is called the first wise merchant in the Celestial Empire is Yi Tingyu, the one who leads the first trade group in the Celestial Empire from that Yi family. Yun Feng remembered, Yi Tingyu. In a rage, she shouts that it's impossible. With her temper, how could she do such a thing? Brother continues, the information from the Earth Hearing Court is not a groundless rumor. It is repeatedly confirmed. Yun Feng is not holding his legs crouched on the throne. Brother clarifies. So, what will the sage do about it? Yun Fen orders, stands down to think it over again. The brother flies off. Yun Fen reasoned. Yi Tingyu, head of the number one trade group in the Middle Kingdom, plus an old acquaintance, it seems that he will still have to go to Jinling by himself. Going from the general to the specific, it's better if he can handle it quietly, considering his relationship with her. The sage flies to Jinling City, the business center of all of China. The Yi Yunfeng family head office building scans the skyscraper using the upper limit of the omniscient eye, the absolute vision of the celestial eyes without omission. The building has a hemispherical magic barrier of the sixth level and consists of five equal parts. One above the other, they increase in aura key. Underneath the ground is a large magic circle that can kill an immortal. Also in the building are five supreme masters. Looking at the aura spreading, they should be the level of the top 20 masters in the world. Yun Feng reasoned that the material resources required to provide all of these barriers could not even be counted daily. 20 great masters, each of them incredibly hard to find, worthy of the first great trading group in the Celestial Empire, the Yi family, the number one merchant family in the world. Yi Tingyu, this girl is unyielding, stubborn. This trip is for his personal purposes. He's going over the options in his mind. If he came here officially as a sage, it would be inappropriate to interfere in the vast underground industry. He would be made a laughingstock. Pass. He owes her a great debt of gratitude and also can't use force like he did against that Rakshasa in the Great Kingdom of Southeast. Pass. Exhales and decides to go in quietly after all. Better to keep a low profile, she won't refuse him. Before entering the skyscraper, Yun Feng decides to observe the situation at the entrance first. He sees a girl handing something to the Ambo standing at the entrance. An employee card? The guard scans the girl's gaze through her card. B-E-E-P. Then tells the girl to pass. It's the latest in personal identification technology. 
where a person's body's genetic information is encoded on the card and subjected to a sky eye scan. Even the most superior disguise techniques can only change appearance, but they can never replicate the genetic information of an object. A nearly perfect identification system. However, there are a few people in the world who can get through it, and Sage is one of those exceptions. Smirk. Sage recalls that there was quite a bit of infiltration and espionage in those years. His hands are already itching. He clenches his hand into a fist. Young Feng is hiding in an alleyway. A girl walks by with a skyscraper entry card attached to a rope around her neck. He renders her unconscious, picks her up and carries her to the side. Pardon me. He's about to borrow the girl's identity. He touches his finger to her forehead. The ultimate transformation technique. The appearance of all living things. The guise of all living beings copies all of the target's genetic information. A superior disguise technique can only be achieved in the Tai Jade Purity Realm. Yun Feng reincarnated and noticed that this body had some endocrine disruptions as well as a weak spleen and stomach. He decided to help the girl cure the cause of this slight ailment. Okay now, the sage casts an invisibility spell, a Vajra magic circle, and a time delay spell on the girl. That way she'll be perfectly safe. Yun Fen, in the guise of a girl with a cart in her hand, stands at the entrance opposite the ambo. The guard asks for an ID card. The girl smiles and hands over her ID card. The guard scans the sage in the guise of a girl through her cart with his gaze. Heaven's Eye. Radiation checks for matches. Young Fen, in the guise of a girl, tries to enter the skyscraper. After the security guard scans him with his gaze through the card of the girl, the wise man has reincarnated as and confirms that the radiation check for matches has been passed. The Ambal gives the card back and says, come in. The girl thanks and enters the building. That's it. Level 1 passed. Yun Feng in the guise of a girl sees a bald guy sitting near the elevator. Puffed. Turns away. What the heck? Isn't that Mr. Mandatory Abstinence? Practicing the Dharma of the Golden Bodhisattva, he lost his way, couldn't control his desires, and became despised by the world. Just a simple and foolish monk, but was able to acquire the unique astral energy of the Vajra King, which is a paired cultivation of the Devil's Path and Buddhism. It is immobile like a mountain, passively activated, invulnerable, and indestructible to any forces. The sage couldn't even destroy it, only subdued it somewhat, and they ended up becoming brothers. Yun Feng reflects that it had been a long time since they had seen the monk. Who would have thought that he was here watching the entrance? What kind of tricks did Yi Ting Yu use? Hem. This guy is pretty thick-skinned, it would probably get an easy pass. A sage in the guise of a girl walks towards the elevator. Ding. The elevator doors open. The monk blocks the way as Yun Feng tries to enter. The sage is confused, holy shit, what's going on? The monk moved closer. The sage is thinking, has he blundered? What went wrong? The monk grudgingly tells Yun Feng in the guise of a girl that she broke her promise yesterday. He waited for her at the hotel all night. What was she doing? Monk is upset, after all. He had carefully planned a date for her. Yun Feng pondered. Huh. They're lovers? Eh, that's too much of a coincidence, no. This body is straight up arousing Mr. Obligatory Abstinence, plus this contrasting appearance of his on the contrary attracts girls. A monk catches the hand of a sage in the guise of a girl, and tries to kiss it, and asks how the girl is going to repay him for his feelings and misguided expectations. The girl pushes the monk's head away with the words that she will go and insists that the monk let her go. The monk clutches tighter in the arms of the sage in the guise of the girl. Doesn't stop trying to kiss her, and says he won't let her go until she tells him the reason. Won't let go until she screams at the top of her voice. Yun Feng, in the guise of a girl, turns away, trying to get out of the monk's embrace. It's a good thing he knows how to deal with this guy, otherwise he'd be in serious trouble. The sage in the guise of a girl gives the monk a hard slap, and then throws a question at him. Approaching and poking the monk in the forehead with her finger, why does the monk ask her? Can't he figure it out by himself? The monk falls to his knees in front of the girl and apologizes, saying he was wrong and will think about it. The sage gets into character and says if the monk doesn't think carefully, he won't look for her. 
and says he's going to work, swinging, turns around, hemph, tink, and steps into the elevator. Doors close. Yun Feng exhales, that was close. The elevator rides upstairs. 11th floor, 20th floor, think. The doors open, he gets out, looks around in bewilderment. Every 20 floors, the elevator changes to prevent infiltration on the top floor. Well thought out, truly family style for the E family. Who could be the doorman on this floor? Near the elevator, an old man with his eyes closed sits in a chair. Yun Feng in the guise of a girl is looking at him. The old man opened his eyes. This is not good. This is the wise accountant Wu Yinching. This man is remarkably gifted. He does not forget what he has seen. He was the best strategist of the Dongfeng house, but was defeated by Wen Yufeng's divine astronomical calculation technique. After defeating the Dongfeng house, he also lost his job. Yun Feng didn't expect it, that he was also hiding here. The old man gestures with his hand to the wise man in the guise of a girl who is staring at him. The girl hesitates and gestures me. Lanshing nods. The sage in the guise of a girl approaches, when asked who is she. He recalls what is written on the ID card and calls out the name Zhao Minghui. The old man says asking who she really is. The girl smiles and covers her mouth with her hand, asking if Mr. Wu is joking. She just goes up to work. Wu Yinxing doesn't believe it and says there are 2,316 people working in this building. From the chairman and general manager to the floor-sweeping aunts and janitors, he knows everyone's name, gender, position, and usual daily tasks. The old man explains that Zhou Minghui is the secretary of the administrative department on the fifth floor recently promoted. She assumed her position 187 days ago, and her current tasks don't overlap with any business areas above the 20th floor. Yun Feng, in the guise of a girl, tries to get out of the situation and says that it was her supervisor who warned this morning. Yinxing wonders what her supervisor's name is. The girl looks flustered. Ah, uh, it's Hei Hei. The sage is confused. What to do, what to do. Someone who can lie in front of this old man hasn't been born yet. That's right. After Yun Feng, in the guise of a girl, fails to trick the wise accountant Wu Yinxing into getting into the elevator, he casts a spell. The technique of reversing yin and yang. The definition of all things yin-yang. The old man looks around in surprise. Everyone has suddenly become completely still. This spell allows you to control the flow of time and the space around you. A unique technique of a sage. Yinxing asks the girl standing in front of him, is this really a sage? The sage exhales and confirms. The old man greets him and says that this time he has come undercover, on an unofficial visit and without a declaration of war. He asks if Yun Feng is looking for the head of the Yi family to discuss some important personal matters. The sage agrees. You smart people are convenient to deal with, and asks Yinxing to assist him. The old man smiles. Convenient, convenient, he now works for the Yi family and is looking for shelter. He knows that the sage and the Yi family have a close relationship. Personal matters can further strengthen this close relationship. The old man says that he will push the boat upstream and of course he will do the courtesy. Yun Feng, who is still also in the guise of a girl, says that the old fox will succeed anywhere, worthy of a wise strategist, and would be foolish not to take a chance. Yin Xing bows slightly, covering one hand with the fist of the other. The world is stabilizing, and the world doesn't need old junk like him doing intrigue and strife. The world needs new talents. He goes on to say that he's out of work and has offended too many people, so it's hard for him to find a place to settle down. And the old man hopes that his holiness understands this. Yun Feng says he understands and asks if he can go up in that case. Yin Xing says he has no problem with that, only there are three people up there, there's no problem with two, he'll tell him how to deal with them. But there is one more, an old acquaintance of the sage, he has to deal with him on his own. The sage thanks and extends his hand for a handshake. This time the old man has helped, they will settle accounts in the future. Yin Xing shakes his hand in return with the hope that his holiness will take care of it. Yun Feng confirms, it's a deal. Both of them smile and in one voice say he he. 80th floor. Ding. The elevator doors open. 
Yen Feng in the guise of a girl, hesitantly first looks out, then steps out. Sees a guy standing with his back to him, a glowing sword hovering behind him. It's an all too familiar silhouette. The sage has a bad feeling about it. The guy asks him, since the unrivaled sage came here, why resort to such tricks? Yun Feng recognized him. Damn it. The first sword master, the crazy swordsman, is Yu Wenfeng. The sage keeps trying to outsmart Wenfeng and says that he's mistaken, that she's just an employee of the company. She's here to deliver a progress report. The crazy swordsman doesn't believe it. Appearance can change, inner being can change, only the soul cannot be changed. The sage is the goal of his life. The aura manifesting in his every move will not let him make a mistake. Yun Feng is confused. Ah, uh, he turns his head around. Clarifies, is there no one else here? Wen Feng says he is alone here, of that his holiness can rest assured. The sage reincarnates into his guise and asks why a swordsman with the highest level of the Tao of the sword is watching the door. What conditions have they offered him? Wenfen replies that this is the only opportunity to ask the sage for a duel. Yunfen is surprised. A. Wenfen could have found him to practice his swordsmanship, but why did he choose this place? Wenfen replied that China is just stabilizing. There is very little chance of drawing the sage's attention to the challenge. One person told him to come here and wait. The opportunity itself will appear. The sage clarifies that this was that very person's intention, wasn't it? Wen Feng is unrivaled among men. The sage, on the other hand, has founded an unprecedented kingdom. It would not be an exaggeration to call it the realm of demigods. The swordsman is delighted by this. Yun Fen says that if the swordsman heard someone else, it would be embarrassing. Wen Fen asks his holiness to cross blades with him. The sage agrees and tells him to approach. Wen Fen takes his sword, pulls it from its sheath. The greatest way of the sword, the return of the sword. Attacks. Yun Feng deemed worthy of the first sword master, this is the highest degree of the sword path. Simply snatch the swordsman's sword, turn it towards the opponent, and in the blink of an eye, everything is complete. If the sage were an ordinary man, he would not have had time to react and would already be dead. But to him, being able to control the flow of time and space around him at will, it still posed no threat. Yun Feng hopes that in the future, he will have rivals who can also break the barrier to this realm. Although he doesn't know how long it will take, this challenge is his gift to help the swordsman reach enlightenment. Yun Feng crosses his index and middle finger in front of his face, which Wen Feng's sword is swiftly bearing down on. He then separates his fingers. It is a gesture of the fingers that conceals the highest Tao. The swordsman flies past the sage without even hitting him with his sword. He lands on his feet, and his sword shatters like glass into many shards. Yun Feng inquires, how's that? The swordsman, clutching the hilt of his sword with a small splinter instead of a blade to his chest, makes a half bow and thanks the sage for the favor and the chance. Yun Feng wonders if he can get up. Wen Feng replies that the head of the Yi family has been waiting for a long time. The sage is puzzled. What? She knows everything. The swordsman confirms. The sage clutches his head in indignation. Then what was he doing for half a day? Oh shit. The swordsman states that the sage's Tao heart is in turmoil. Top floor, the office of the CEO of the Yi sage enters. Not far from the opposite wall is a desk with someone sitting in a back turned chair. Yun Feng says that it's been a long time, what show. Even in this room, there are so many hidden magic circles located. The once calculating daughter of the Yi family is now at the helm of the first trade group of the Middle Kingdom. The man in the chair responds that his holiness is mistaken. He turns around. The sage didn't expect to see a young man in a mask. The young man taps his desk with two fingers. A table and two benches appear beside Yun Feng. On the table are tea items. The young man gets up from his desk and asks the sage to take a seat. The sage sits down and asks who he is and where is Yi Tingyu. The young man replies that she is his mother. Is he really the son of the new head of the Yi family, Yi Tingyu, who is rumored to rarely show his face in public? The young man clarifies, did the sage come in disguise this time because he needs the Yi family to do something secretly? Yun Feng is puzzled. Eh? Uh, 
How does he know the purpose of his visit? The young man walks over to the panoramic windows and explains that the magical barriers outside are just a decoy. There are Heaven's Eye spies on all sides every hundred meters. He knew this as soon as the sage arrived here. If the sage had come with evil intent, the young man would have already been 10,000 lie away. Then they wouldn't have met. Yun Feng notices that, indeed, the apple is from the apple tree. Subtle wit and cunning. The young man takes a seat at the table across from the sage, pours tea and says that this is the highest praise a businessman can receive. So what has the sage arrived for this time? The young man asks to be told directly. The sage brings the tea bowl to his lips. He has heard that the new head of the E family is young but witty, and his skills are as good as his mother's. The young man thinks that the great sage is flattering him. This is all due to the instruction he received from his mother. Yenfen tells that at one time he and his mother had a strong friendship. He is grateful to her for saving his life. At that time, the young man was not yet alive. The sage did not expect that after all these years her child would be so mature. The young man interrupts him. If the sage wishes to talk about the past, he advises him to schedule a meeting at another time. After all, his plan is minute by minute. Yunfeng clarifies by minute by minute. Yi Tingyu Sun taps his finger on the table, which immediately displays a map with the names of different territories. Qin, Yang, Jin, Ying, Su, Yu, Liang, Jing, Ling. And above the desk, a hologram with a to-do list stretched high up. First, negotiating the full acquisition of the Saikong family's stake in the Chancery office. Second, negotiating the mining rights of the crystal mines. Third, demolition and relocation of the artifact trading complex on land in Jingzhou. Fourth, acquisition of a 45% equity interest in Ying Heavenly Logistics Company. Yunfeng was surprised. The supreme secret technique of Mei Divine Arts, the Kyushu Small Kyankan Method, is being used to transfer information for commercial purposes. In the entire Celestial Empire, there are only a few people with the financial and human resources to create such a strange seal. At such a young age, Yi Ting Yu Sun is constantly laboring to handle many important matters on a daily basis. As far as the sage could remember, he was still a child in his years, struggling to survive in Jiangku. This boy has a great future ahead of him, Yi has a great son. The young man says that the world of business is like a battlefield. While he can be more efficient, money for him is just a set of numbers that he can earn sooner or later. Therefore, he suggests that his holiness should speak plainly. Yunfeng agrees, tell him straight, he hopes that the Yi family will immediately stop the production and distribution of the number one love potion in the Celestial Empire, Scorching Sun Powder. Yi Sun Tingyu replies, no, it's impossible. The sage is furious. What a goose. He refuses so flatly. Doesn't he take the sage seriously? The young man respectfully replies that he would not dare. If the sage wanted to ban the powder, he would only have to issue a secret decree, and who in China would dare to disobey him? The young man doesn't understand, so why would the sage quietly come and waste the time of both parties? Yun Feng's mind flashed back to the events of how Xuan Feng Su and Yi Huang Wang, while under the influence of the scorching sun powder, used it. The sage says that he personally came here with this request, can't Yi Ting Yu's son fulfill it? The young man replies that he is the new head of the Yi family. If he stops work at the request of random passersby, then doesn't the sage think that the Yi family will soon go bankrupt? Moreover, the scorching sun powder has come out in small quantities, so why did Yunfeng decide to stop its production? The sage insists that this scorching sun is clouding people's minds and harming the innocent. It shouldn't exist at all. The young man disagrees. Even if there is no scorching sun powder, there will still be many love potions in the world that will harm people. Will his holiness finish his investigation? Will he then ban all love potions completely? The sage doesn't know what to answer. Well, Yi Ting Yu Sun continues, the Yi family's small distribution of the scorching sun powder is very important, and the consequences will be quite extensive. Should the Yi family really get rid of this powder just because the sage said so? The sage's eyes lit up with flames and anger. 
How dare ye tend you, son? The sage's entire body is surrounded by flames. As a result, the young man's mask breaks into two pieces and falls off his face. After Yi Ting Yu's son's mask split in two and flew off his face, Yun Feng looks at the young man and is perplexed. He, why does he look so familiar? The young man stands up, brings his hand to his face. Another mask of the same kind appears on his face. He says if the sage wanted to, he could even dissolve Yi's family, let alone some powder. Could his family say a word? Could Celestia object? Only the young man wonders if Celestia is really as his holiness described it, unifying the divine realm. Is the sage sure that the celestial empire is its people? In essence, the celestial realm is still only his holiness, is he right? Yun Feng exhales. Who? What a scoundrel this young man is. Using his own words to shut his own mouth. At this moment, if the sage uses force and forces Yi Ting Yu's son to do as said, if it becomes known that the sage has lost the trust of the celestial realm, ruling people will not be easy. The young man agrees. Absolutely right. If the sage has no more business here, he asks him to return. Yun Feng smirks. Hemph. With a businesslike look and a smile on his face, he says, Youths are youths, although he doesn't know why the youth doesn't agree to do him this favor, but asks him not to underestimate him. He won't back down so easily. And so Yi Ting Yu's son knows, the sage was able to rule the divine state through more than just skill. The young man wonders what the sage wants. The sage continues, the celestial empire is stabilizing. Governing the country involves pacifying the people. It is most convenient to do this by managing finances, and the Yi family is the first trading company in the celestial empire. Yun Feng says that he came here for a few days to consult, and for the sake of the stability of the Middle Kingdom, the Yi family will not refuse him, right? The sage ponders that Yi Ting Yu's son is a snotty boy. If you follow him every day, once he sells the scorching sun powder, the sage will be able to ruin everything at once. He wants to see how the young boy can tolerate it. Yi Ting Yu's son is confused and hesitantly says that his holiness is in charge of many things, and the celestial empire still needs to be revitalized. One person cannot be divided into several, and asks where. Where does the sage get the time to be with him all the time? Yun Feng bifurcated. How many people are there? On the right, another clone of the sage appears behind the young man and asks how the young man thinks the sage stands out among the greats of this world. On the left, another clone grudgingly says that since he can't come secretly and ask politely, then he'll have to act differently. Yun Feng sits on a bench at the table, his four clones surrounded on all sides by the puzzled young man. The clone behind him places his hands on the young man's shoulders and presses down. Yi Ting Yu's son humbly takes a seat on the bench and pounds his fists on the table. Yun Feng explains that this technique requires considerable mental effort and cannot be performed for a long time, but it will suffice for seven or eight months. Suddenly both hear a woman's voice asking the young man if her son has realized the power of the sage. A circle-shaped cut has formed in the ceiling. Yun Feng and his clones watch as the circular part of the ceiling slowly slides down. On it is a chair where Yi Tingyu is sitting. The clones dissolved into thin air. Click. The round part of the ceiling reached the floor. The young man stands up and greets his mother, who tells him to go back. Now it is her turn. The son agrees. Yi Ting Yu's son walks out of the study. The woman playfully says that indeed she and his holiness have not seen each other for a long time. He just arrived and immediately showed his power to her son. Yun Feng agrees that he and Ting Yu haven't seen each other in a long time and thinks after all these years, this woman still makes him nervous. She asks why the sage is so insistent about the scorching sun powder. Yun Feng tries to explain it's because he, his friend, suffered from this powder, as well as some other great people of the world suffered weighty damage. If it wasn't for the Yi family, he would have shut down the business, for the sake of the righteous Tao. The one in wonders if his holiness knows the original name of the scorching sun powder. Yun Feng is surprised. Ting Yu continues that the real name of this medicine is a miracle drug called child-giving guanine. The sage interjects. Guanin who gives children. The woman says it refers to their son. Yun Feng is in a stupor. 
Damn, seriously, she continues. Originally, it's a miracle cure for female infertility. It helped many people who couldn't have children realize their dreams. It applies to her as well. The sage is puzzled. I. You? Tingyu confirms, that's right, she was 28 years old, but the Tianqui never appeared. She puts her hands on her lower abdomen. Her family visited many famous doctors, but they diagnosed Tingyu as an orphaned yin. She was destined to die alone, without children. Eventually, she found the Valley of the King of Medicine and asked for the formula for a cure. Sage clarifies, the Valley of the King of Medicine. It's a place where helping the world and saving people is the main goal, right? How could Lyangson create such a harmful substance? The woman is surprised. Does the sage know Lyangson too? After all, she is afraid of outsiders, but she is mastering the highest stage of the immortal Tao of healing with all her diligence. The sage excuses himself. It, it was six years ago, and then I came to my senses. Hey, he's the one asking her now. Tells Tingyu not to change the subject. The woman shows her displeasure, himph, and then goes on with the story. Guanyin giving children is a miraculous medicine for women that nourishes yin and perfects them, rebuilds and can be said to bring faded female bodies back to life. Within three days they can have a child. But because the action is too strong, it makes the body blaze. The medicine has become used by those with ulterior motives to harm people. Tingju asks if the medicine and the healers themselves are to blame. Yunfeng doesn't understand, since she knew. Why let the scorching sun powder out for auction? The woman sighs. It was to protect Liangxin and preserve this miracle medicine that could save thousands of women. Soon after Yunfeng left the Yi family back then, there were evil people with ulterior motives who used this medicine to harm others. Subsequently, this began to worsen. Tingyu tried her best to stop it, but she couldn't. She even sought out inferno patients to come and ask for the medicine. Thus, she had a plan. The Yi family stopped the public sale of Guanyin giving children and changed its name to February Spring Wind. The family also quarantined patients to stop the flow of this medicine. It was Guanyin giving children. It became February Spring Wind. The packaging and brand name changed. After that, this medicine continued to leak in small quantities on the black market under the name Scorching Sun. In time, the world will only know the number one love potion in the Celestial Empire, Scorching Sun Powder. Everyone will forget about the drug Guanyin, giving children. In February, Spring Wind will continue to benefit patients. Yunfeng, after hearing Tim Yu's story about the Yi family changing the packaging and name of the medicine, Guanyin giving children, to February spring wind, wistfully says that making just the appearance of change. So, like her, calling Tingyu a businesswoman. The woman replies that it's the best she could come up with, and asks if the sage has any better ideas. The sage says, except that this scorching sun powder leak is also causing a lot of problems. Tingyu grudgingly replies that before the scorching sun powder, there was still more than enough wedding powder in the world. Firewood which were harming the world. However, Guanyin giving children saved thousands of times more families who were passionate about having a child than others. Scorching sun powder is a small calamity compared to saving millions of infertile families. She asks, what would a wise man do in her place? The sage gives up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He can't argue with her. He admits she's won, but his friend was harmed by the scorching sun powder. And since Tingyu has found a way to control the use of the February spring wind, can she stop it from being sold at the auction? Yunfeng says he will owe her. We'll do whatever she wants for her. The woman nonchalantly says the number five. The sage gets angry. Well, what? Hey, is she haggling the market? Five is too much. Two. Two at the most. Tingyu calmly says four. The sage disagrees. No, it's still too much. Three. He points three fingers. Three at the most. The woman holds out her hand and says deal. Yun Feng shakes her hand in surprise. Ah, uh, why does he have a feeling that something is wrong? Why did she agree so quickly? Ting Yu admits because Lian Xin had already researched the new medicine and the side effects had disappeared. That's why they were originally going to stop selling the medicine. The sage is shocked. 
Holy crap, he realized. They, mother and son, had joined forces to trick him, right? From the beginning, her son had been testing Yunfeng. Went against him and trying to anger him to find out the purpose of the visit. Then Ting Yu came on the scene and started to make a deal with him. From start to finish, he, he was trapped in their trap. The one replied that compared to the time when he callously, quietly, and unnoticeably disappeared without a trace, he had really succeeded, a businessman's visage. Tin Yu's three words were like three swords thrust into the sage's chest, callously, quietly, inconspicuously. He's outraged, hey, what do you mean quietly? He just didn't want to cause trouble for them. Ting Yu unhappily turns his head away and says, Inf. Even a puppy and a kitten that had been treated, clothed, fed, and fed for over a year said goodbye if they had to leave. Only a soulless person can suddenly disappear without taking a speck of dust with them. Yunfeng is perplexed. Hey, weren't they just having a good chat just now? Why is she suddenly talking about this? The sage excuses himself. He had no choice. Besides, he's grateful for her kindness in taking him in. Otherwise, where would the Yi family be now? Tingyu folds her arms under her chest and says that they will consider it one to one, so now let the sage please repay her. The sage is indignant. Ah, uh, so soon. She's been calculating this for how long, nasty woman. Tingyu grabs Yun Feng by the pecs and bursts out screaming demanding him to stop thinking of her as someone who is always looking for profit. She keeps shouting that this is very urgent. The conditions have just been met, she can't allow a moment's delay. The wise man tells her not to mess with his head. What kind of business can't the head of the first trade group in the Celestial Empire handle? Tingyu let go of him and tilted her head frustratedly. Even her, there are times when she can't do anything. Yunfeng doesn't understand. Hey, her, what's wrong with her? How can they keep arguing when she suddenly becomes like this? Ugh. Sage continues that actually, Tingyu can stop pretending to be a businesswoman already. Even if it's not a deal, they've known each other for so long. If she's in trouble, he's willing to help in any way he can. Tingyu asks to save their son and daughter. She has run out of options. These words seem to fall on the sage's head. Son. Daughter. Ours. The words press harder and harder. He falls. The world turned gray. Snap. It was as if the sage had given a crack and was about to split apart. He stopped realizing who he was, where he was, where he was from, where he was going. Who did he say this child looked like? Yunfeng realized that Ting Yu's son was an exact replica of him when he was young. The silence hanging in the air is broken by the sage's shout. Dil Yu, when did they have a child? Before he left, he treated her with respect and never crossed the line. Painfully, he grabs Ting Yu's arm. She pulls away and turns away, says faintly, who asked his fool to behave like that? The sage asks. Dai. What did she say? Tingyu turns around and says that everything is heaven's will. If you mix child giving guanine with alcohol, the mixture will have the desired effect on a woman, but on a man. The sage is nervous. What will happen if the man drinks? She says that 18 years ago, she had prepared a medicinal wine and was just about to drink it, but was interrupted. 18 years ago, Tingyu is in the room. He sits at the table and holds the paper-wrapped medicine, Guanyin, the child giver, in his hands. Pours it into a jug of wine. She is about to pour the mixture into a bowl. There is a knock on the door. The girl hides the medicine packet behind her corsage. What is it? Young Yunfeng walks in and says that the tax bread ships are still at the wharf. There's a problem. The owner is calling for her. Tingyu replies understandably and asks her to watch the room of the day her no one to let anyone in. And also calling the young sage a bloody drunkard, categorically forbids touching the booze on the table. The young sage agrees. Yun Feng, after listening to Ting Yu's story, nervously says that he remembers this part. And then what? Then? The woman says that when she returned, she found him sprawled out on the table. He had drunk almost all the wine. Yun Feng gets even more nervous and asks, Ah, oh, what's next? Next. Tingyu angrily replies that of course she drank the rest. The sage frantically asks, and so what? 
What Ting Yu excitedly goes on to say, the next day when she woke up in bed, he, naked, was sleeping soundly next to her. She just, just, just. Ting Yu tells Yunfeng how she woke up in bed and he was naked sleeping soundly next to her. The girl then decided that one way or another, one day, this goon would leave her. The wise man clarifies, you what? The woman says that she then brought him back to the table and pretended that nothing had happened, to save everyone the embarrassment. The sage doesn't understand why. Is he, Lin Yunfeng, such an irresponsible person? The woman asks him, at that time, if he knew about it, would he have stayed with her forever in the Yi family? Yunfen wonders why she thinks he wouldn't. Tingyu bursts out laughing. He might have. But, the moment she found him, she already knew that his place was not by her side. At that time, young Yunfeng's will had faded, and he valued alcohol as his life. She asked him to watch outside her door. And that was the only time she made a deal and suffered a loss. The wise man can't get a word in edgewise. The woman continues, but the three favors she asked of him this time, three favors from the most awe-inspiring, unrivaled man in China, will finally allow her to recoup the money she invested. There was a pause. Yunfeng suggests we talk about the children after all. They? What happened to them? Although his son is a bit indifferent, but there are hardly a few people his age in the world who can remain as calm in front of a sage from start to finish like him. Only being overly harsh and unable to restrain himself can offend many people. Yunfen clarifies, no one is after him, right? Tingyu shakes his head from side to side and says that as a businessman, their son is really the best. He is vastly superior to his peers. Even she is not as good as him when it comes to business strategy and determination. Yunfeng agrees. Yeah, even though the sage outplayed him just now, he's glad that Ting Yu raised such a good son. Now doesn't know why, the sage is also a little happy. The woman hesitantly says, Ah, uh, actually, he, 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 he's not their son. The sage's jaw drops from surprise and surprise. Eh? What the? Tingyu moved closer to him and whispered in his ear that this, this is, this is their daughter. The sage's shout can be heard not only in the entire skyscraper, but even beyond. Ha. Huh. The woman covers his mouth with her hands and tells him to be quiet. Isn't the sage always restrained? Lin Yunfei stared at Yi Tingyu in surprise as he grabbed her slender hand. What the woman said shook him to the core and she still wants him to remain restrained in a situation like this. To the sage, it was simply impossible because he personally had no idea how this situation could have arisen. Yi Tingyu lowered her gaze to the floor, unable to find the right words in her soul. After all, she needed some time to gather her thoughts. She withdrew her hand from Lin Yunfei's palm, still not looking him in the eyes. She stepped back and took a seat at the table, silently inviting the man to settle down across from her on a nearby couch. The sage, realizing this, heeded the nonverbal signs, taking the offered seat. He was ready to listen to Yi Ting Yu's story. Yi's eyebrows furrowed in regret. It was obviously difficult for her to remember, and even more difficult for her to form it into a coherent and understandable story, but she couldn't stay silent either. After a few moments of silence, Yi Tingyu spoke slowly and thoughtfully. It turned out that after the twins were born, the Yi family's affairs were in a precarious position. The then young girl's father, who had become the head of the family, had only one daughter, herself. In the era of turmoil, there were competitors outside casting greedy glances, and inside, there were parts of the family hungry for profit. As one could understand, there was quite a lot of strife, and Yi Tingyu, was at the very epicenter of it. She had a lot to do, and if she couldn't handle all the difficulties that came their way, the Yi family would definitely fall apart, leaving behind a burning hulk. As you can understand, the Harris had no margin for error. She devoted almost all her time to the family business. She sorted out and signed countless papers that seemed to never end, but only multiplied each time more and more. She dealt with technical plans, going on site to assess the situation and personally communicating with important employees. She stayed up all night long, only to fall asleep at her desk a few days later, surrounded by business plans. It was really hard. Lin Yunfei, comprehending everything he had heard, looked at the woman seriously. 
She was able to overcome those turbulent times with her own strength and turned the Yi family into the number one trading company in the Middle Kingdom. The hardship and anxiety associated with this would not be understood by those who were in no way in touch with the economic field. But Lin Yunfei himself was well aware of the full scale of the work done by this amazing woman. It can be said that it was Yi Tingyu's help that created the opportunity for China's unification. She definitely deserves the name of the Sage of Commerce, Ye Chen Yu. Lin Yunfei didn't hesitate to express this opinion to the woman herself, but she continued to sit with her head down and her lips pressed together. Even though her children's father's words sounded very comforting and supportive, she was still deeply regretful even now. Yi Tingyu had neglected to take care of the most important thing in her life, her children, who she had once been willing to go to great lengths to have. Lin Yunfei exhaled heavily, closing his eyes. All these topics were very ambiguous and could be discussed for a long time, and the sage, although he enjoyed the company of his old friend, wanted to get to the point. Unobtrusively, the man brought the conversation back to the previous direction. How did it happen that their child became like this? Yi Tingyu shook her head, but continued her story. Her children, despite their mother's constant business, grew up to be very caring and incredibly understanding, but when they turned six. At this point in past history, the woman gritted her teeth. The children had been kidnapped then. Upon hearing this, the sage opened his eyes in astonishment and furrowed his brows. How could Yi Tingju even let this happen? The man asked the same question aloud and angrily squeezed his palm on the armrest too hard. The wood beneath his fingers cracked and crumbled to the floor with a loud crunch. Yi Tingju opened her mouth in surprise, but quickly hid her emotions. After correcting her glasses, she informed Lin Yunfei that 300 years ago, the chair the man was sitting on was the favorite piece of the first human warrior turned living Buddha, Wu Xuantong. It was decorated with an engraving depicting dragons, the last remaining carved piece, and heirloom. It was worth paying an appropriate amount of money for the damage it had caused. Lin Yunfei, who hadn't calculated his strength, only looked at the wreckage of the armrest in confusion. He then looked at the nonchalant woman who had made such a specific economic remark to him. That was the thing about Yi Tingju. Her nature as a merchant was unchanging, and had remained so for as long as they had known each other. Lin Yunfei used the yin-yang reversal, and the ancient relic returned to its original state in a few moments. Looking at the woman, he asked her opinion on the technique. It looked spectacular and quite practical. Yi Tingju once again had a surprised expression on her face. She started to say that if she had originally, However, she stopped in the middle of the sentence and refused to continue, shaking her head from side to side as if throwing away the thoughts that had arisen from her head. Yi Tingyu decided to continue the story, which was interrupted by Lin Yunfei's spontaneous display of emotion. The kidnapping of the twins was so sudden and strange that the woman was still unable to find any clues. On the day of the incident, she was checking the reports of the Yi family's main businesses as usual when the children's nanny burst into the office with loud shouts. Yi Tingyu, who was at first immersed in her work, did not take her eyes off her paperwork and advised the girl who had worked for her for so many years not to panic when something went wrong. The nanny actually stopped yelling loudly, instead whispering the news of the missing children into her ear. The unprepared woman dropped the reports from her hands, and the sound of a pen rolling across the floor was deafening in the resulting silence. At that moment, Yi Tingyu froze for a few moments, and then turned to the nanny with the question that was asked in this situation, how is this even possible? After all, the bodyguards of the Yi family are some of the best in the world, not even a slanted glance towards their employer, not that kidnapping was even possible in theory. There were tears in the nanny's eyes. She started to agree that their security was really serious. Everything was just as the head of the E family had said, but the children had simply disappeared. All that was left was the ransom demand letter. She knew nothing more about what had happened. And Yi Tingyu, thrown into the abysses of despair in an instant, ran away from the study, ordering the nanny to follow her. She used all of the E family's information resources, but never found any clues. All her attempts were a waste of time and effort. 
There was a silence between Lin Yunfei and Yi Tingyu, which the sage was the first to break. Based on what he had heard, he concluded that the kidnappers were obviously not ordinary people, since they had managed to steal children from under the noses of so many masters. And if the target could afford to hire such experts, it should probably not be difficult to identify such a person, even by the banal method of exclusion. At least, the man assumed that was the case. However, Yi Tingyu, who had worked in this field for a long time, thought differently. After all, business is like war, but it is completely different from a battlefield. When two people fight each other, one will die and the other will be injured, or they will both die. It's relatively simple here. But in business, if people oppose each other, hundreds of people can lose everything overnight. That's why there are a lot of enemies, and it's almost impossible to find evidence, because everyone is careful and prudent when they make a mess. There's just no room for speculation. Anyone can be, anyone can be, anyone can be not. That's the problem. The sage listened attentively to the woman's explanation, and when she fell silent, he began to rise from his seat, wondering how the children had been found after all. Yi Tingyu shook her head. Even a month after the kidnapping, they couldn't find the strings that could finally lead them to the twins, but everything had resolved itself. The woman then couldn't find a place for herself from the anxiety eating away at her fears for the children's lives and the utter futility of searching for them. Just as on the day of the kidnapping, the nanny burst into the office screaming. Gasping for breath from running fast, she brought good news this time, the young master and mistress had returned, but the girl could not bring them to her mother because the young master would not let anyone near them, so she had to leave them at the entrance. Yi Tingyu rushed to the entrance as fast as she could, unable to feel her legs with excitement. On the top step of the gate, she saw her shabby and dirty son carrying his twin sister on his back. The sight of the children tempered their mother's joy. The smile faded from her face, and instead tears ran down her cheeks, and she covered her mouth with the palm of her hand in horror. But the exhausted son weakly raised his head, looking at his mother with tired eyes, and then lowered his gaze to the floor again. He squeezed his eyes shut, and with his sister on his back, began to fall forward onto the woman who opened her arms to embrace him. Yi Tingyu on the day her children were finally home cried and cradled them in her arms. Lai Yunfei saw how difficult this story was for the woman, and yet he asked her to continue. What happened to the children and how did they escape? Yi Tingyu did not immediately answer the question. She stood up from her seat and walked to the window, looking at the city panorama thoughtfully and sadly. The woman continued speaking from there. After this kidnapping, the children's characters changed drastically. The son became callous to everyone except his mother and sister. He had no compassion for others, and the daughter. Yi Tingyu, who was usually very collected and serious, had bitter tears in her eyes, which she hid from Lin Yunfei. Lifting her glasses, the woman wiped the salty moisture from her eyelashes and cheeks with her palm. Only then did she speak again. If the son is home, the daughter locks herself in her room. She eats three times a day, washes and brushes her teeth, goes to the toilet, but never goes outside. The mother and her twin are the only ones allowed to go into the room, even the servants are forbidden to do so. But every time the son goes somewhere on business, his twin sister immediately changes. It's like she becomes her brother herself and helps him with all the inside chores. Lin Yunfei slightly turned his head towards the entrance where Yi Tingyu had pointed. There, behind the door, sat their mutual daughter, who was trying her best to replace her brother. The man turned fully towards Yi Tingyu. He had a legitimate question for her. Why didn't she bother to look for him when all this happened? The woman exhaled a little tiredly, as if her interlocutor had said something stupid. However, she did not leave him without an answer. The thing was, Yi Tingyu had always watched the sage, and although the children never asked their mother about their daddy, the woman knew for a fact that their father held a special place in their hearts. She just couldn't find the right moment to tell them everything. At that time, the sage was fighting battles everywhere, his name shuddering throughout the Celestial Empire. It is not surprising that the man had a decent number of enemies. Revealing that such a prominent person had children would end badly for everyone.
Yi Tingyu was smart. She understood this, so she continued to keep silent year after year. Lam Yun Fai pressed his lips into a thin line and frowned slightly. There was something resembling regret in his eyes. The woman turned her head away from him, interlocking her fingers in a nervous gesture. The sage walked toward her with his hands behind his back. Looking to the side, the man noticed that Yi Tingyu, for as long as he had known her, had always liked to show off her strength. The female interlocutor looked at him incomprehensively. Now it was Lin Yunfei's turn to explain the meaning behind his words. He meant that relying on someone from time to time, such as him, is useful at times and will hurt a woman's ego to a much lesser extent than she herself believes. Sage himself had once not been shy about asking his brothers for help, and it had happened not once or twice, but countless times to become the man he was now. For some reason, this made Yi Tingju blush and her cheeks flushed. She immediately turned away and asked as indifferently as possible if the man had a solution to the situation. Lin Yunfei was certain, to cure a heart, you needed another heart. Therefore, he asked for permission to try his methods. The sage closed his eyelids, concentrating the energy in his head and applied the technique of understanding another's mind. Immediately, the world appeared to him in an inverse light, and through the walls Lin Yunfei could see his daughter sitting on the couch and then the girl's mind in his head. But he went further, penetrating into the brain, which consisted of many neural connections through which impulses flashed. The first level of understanding another's mind allows one to sense what the object is thinking, experiencing, and feeling. Therefore, the sage was soon able to see through another's eyes, hovering an invisible phantom over his daughter. At this moment, the daughter was waiting with some tension for the end of her mother's conversation with the sage. They had been talking for quite some time, which made the girl a little nervous. What decision were the two adults going to make? The daughter clenched the white fabric of her pants and exhaled. The sage was indeed an outstanding man. He looked formidable and imposing, did not emit waves of power and that unprecedented magic. At that moment, all the girl's determination seemed to fly away. Her clenched fist shook with tension. She's still not strong enough. When her brother isn't around, she can only rely on herself to protect her little sister. To do so, one must become even, even more, and even more dependable. But what was possible for that to happen? What exactly should she do? She couldn't answer these questions, so she was even more worried. This was what Lin Yunfei saw, hovering over his daughter as an invisible phantom and reading all of her thoughts. It seemed to him that something was definitely wrong. The daughter suddenly jerked and looked around as if she sensed the intangible presence of a man. The sage decided to finish, returning to his material body in the study. As soon as Lin Yunfei opened his eyes, Yi Tingju hurriedly approached him, looking at his face expectantly. She wanted to hear the man's verdict as soon as possible. After all, he could shed some light on the situation. The sage exhaled, but did not keep the woman waiting too long. He saw in his daughter a completely independent person who sees herself as a brother protecting her sister. Because of this, she struggles to grow up and become stronger. Yi Tingju lowered her head and covered her eyes. And earlier attempts had been made to find out what was really going on in her daughter's mind to try and help. But just as the sage had said, she wasn't trying to pretend to be her elder brother to hide herself, but really thought she was him. But could not even the sage, famous for his ability to accomplish the impossible, do anything about it? Lim Yunfei was silent for a moment, selecting the most understandable wording, and then explained the fact that there were six ways for humans to know the world around them. Ears, eyes, nose, tongue, body, and mind. On the first layer of understanding another's mind, one can only recognize thoughts. It is good for getting information, but it is not good for dealing with situations like this that require a more subtle approach. So the sage was going to go to the next layer. This is where the thoughts come into play, the moment at which all thoughts arise, and it's what Buddhists call the consciousness of judgment, the seventh sense. In Taoism, it's called the time of the emergence of thought. There are quite a few people who are able to recognize thoughts by understanding other people's minds, but not many who are able to reach the time of thoughts. 
Yi Tingyu was impressed by this information and watched with some amazement as the man hovered in the air with his legs folded in a butterfly formation. He joined his hands together, extending his index fingers and intertwining the rest. Concentrating, he closed his eyelids. After a few moments, he applied the second layer of understanding of another's mind, mind visitation. His energy connected with his daughter's mind, who noticed the subtle changes but could not understand their source. The sage found himself surrounded by myriads of thoughts dwelling in someone else's mind. He put his hands behind his back and searched for the information he needed with his keen eye. The thing is that during the emergence, during one moment there are up to 400 thoughts and you can see the reason for their occurrence. That was what he needed to know. The sage continued to gaze into his daughter's thoughts, constantly turning his head one way and another. In one thought, the daughter was thinking that she was very weak, much weaker than she should be, but she longed to be stronger and better. In another, the girl was clutching her head in despair, not understanding the reason for her older brother's absence for so long, because if he was here instead of her, he wouldn't be so pathetic and helpless. She wanted to be like him for then she would definitely be able to protect her little sister. In her third thought, her daughter pondered the possibility of luring the sage to her side, but she immediately dismissed this option, because she trusted no one but her older brother, herself, and her mother. The girl forbade herself to be weak. Pensively observing all the thoughts, Lin Yunfei lowered his head in thought. All of his daughter's thoughts were in one way or another about protecting her sister. Involuntarily, this made the man's heart clench. He gripped his shirt in the chest area. What was this poor child going through? Suddenly, a large lilac sphere with a memory approached the sage. He turned toward it, staring in surprise at the scene before him. It was truly horrifying. There was a little girl in a dirty corner, huddled together, her thin legs shackled to a heavy metal ball. Nearby was a bowl, and near it some bones from the scraps. It was a clear sign that the locked child had been fed sparingly. The girl with a completely blank stare, in which large tears froze, thought about how scared and bad she was. She mentally begged her older brother to come to her aid. Such a cruel and pitiful sight struck Lin Yunfei to the core. He involuntarily reached for a memory, but it suddenly began to expand. The rest of the thoughts followed. They grew larger, quickly shrinking the empty space the sage was actually in. Everything happened so quickly that the man had no time to do anything before the spheres with thoughts were giving him up among themselves. All of them contained only one simple and bitter meaning that filled his mind to overflowing. His daughter wanted to protect her little sister at any cost. She must keep her safe. But what must she do to do so? What? Yi Tingju, flustered, was waiting obediently at this time, gazing into the sage's calm face as he suddenly opened his eyes abruptly. He, absolutely dumbfounded, stared at her silently for several more agonizingly long moments. The woman couldn't bear the anticipation and immediately asked him about the results of the technique. The sage was a bit confused after what he had seen, but he didn't want to leave Yi Tingyu to speculate. He assumed that because the child's heart cried out strongly for someone who wanted to protect her, she had formed her current personality by wanting to always be able to protect herself. This made the man who deeply sympathized with these children clench his fists in impotent anger. What had happened to them after all, since it had caused such a profound change in the unfortunate child's soul? Something truly terrible must have happened. Yi Tingyu, whose worst guesses were confirmed, couldn't hold back her feelings and tears glistened again, trembling on her long eyelashes. Biting her lips from the emotions she was experiencing, the woman recounted the attempts she had made over the years to find out the details of those events. But she had unfortunately never learned anything. She had no leads to the perpetrators on her hands, and her children do not agree to talk about those events. Lin Yunfei sighed. Even the second stage technique didn't work properly, he could only speculate what the reason was. For this, the man admittedly felt guilt towards both his mother and children. Yi Tingyu, on the other hand, cried without trying to wipe the wet paths from her cheeks. She knew that their daughter was suffering so much, so she didn't dare to show her worry in front of her. The woman told herself time after time that she had to be strong and had to make the child feel safe. To this day, Yi Tingyu still regretted being so careless.
It would have been better if those bastards had come right after her, so why harm an innocent child? Shivers shook the grieving mother and Lin Yunfei, who empathized with her, placed his hand on the woman's fragile shoulder in an attempt to support her. There was another layer in understanding another person's mind. He knows everything, but the next layer is what Buddhists call the storehouse of consciousness, the source of the mind. At the origin of the mind, unlike the past layer where thoughts originate, everything there is limitless. In order to stay in that realm without losing oneself, one must have a clear mind and be able to enter a state without thoughts or thoughts without reaching deep meditation. Even though Lin Yunfei can enter there because of his many struggles, his thoughts follow the path of violence, so if he tries to do so forcibly, he might irreparably harm his daughter's soul. However, there is someone else in the world who can enter that realm. Yi Tingyue, already a little calmer, assumed that the man was referring to Bai Haishin of the Pure Mind sect. The fact that the woman knew her surprised the sage. However, Yi Tingyue brushed it off. Who doesn't know Bai Haishin from the holy land of the Pure Mind Buddhist sect? Besides, the woman has been searching for Bai Haishin for years without success, but the location of this person is hidden. She appears and then disappears again, so far Yi Tingyue has not been able to find the woman. Lin Yunfei looked away and awkwardly scratched his cheek. He actually had a way to find Bai Haishin. Such news immediately made his female interlocutor extremely indignant. Why hadn't the man told her about such an important detail earlier? Why did he keep silent? But the wise man himself was very uncomfortable. It reminded him of a past he did not want to remember. He had no reason to look for his old acquaintance. However, Yi Tingyue cared little about Lin Yunfei's personal feelings on the matter. She gustily grabbed his hand and demanded the man take her to Bai Haishin right now. As their luck would have it, the Yi family had recently completed a long-distance divine travel system, so they had the ability to go anywhere within the divine state. This made things much easier. A slightly dazed Lin Yunfei asked the woman to slow down and stop. Yi Tingyue turned around, not understanding the reason for the delay. Then, her gaze dropped to their intertwined palms, and she immediately unclenched her fingers with some embarrassment, letting go of the other's hand. A blush of embarrassment spread across her cheeks. She nervously tucked a strand of hair behind her ear and asked him wouldn't he want their daughter to get well soon? The sage rubbed his neck. Of course, he wanted this as much as Yi Tingyue herself, but the woman still should have waited for him to contact Bai Haishin himself. He had some way of contacting the girl that the man couldn't describe. Hearing this, Yi Tingyue's face immediately darkened, looking almost with anger. An indescribable method of communication. The sage scratched the back of his head awkwardly and turned away, unable to bear his friend's stern gaze. He folded his hands as if in a prayer gesture and applied the heart of worldly bonds, the law of soul secrecy. Mentally, he called out to Bai Haishin by name. To the man's luck, he was quickly answered, and Lin Yunfei reported that he had one request for his acquaintance. Bai Haishin wordlessly named her location, the Valley of the Healing King. Lin Yunfei gave the same information to Yi Tingyue and told her that they could leave, but she looked quite upset. She said that she would not go anywhere with him and would ask China's first sage to go to the Valley of the Healing King himself, even though a moment ago she had been eager to find Bai Haishin herself. But when the man pointed out this contradictory behavior to her, Yi Tingyue turned away, folding her arms on her chest, showing that the conversation between them was over. This, to be honest, was confusing to Lin Yunfei. Yi Tingyue said very formally that since Bai Haishin was an old acquaintance of the sage, her own presence there was inappropriate. After that, she strode past the man with dignity and sat down at her desk. The head of the Yi family quickly typed something on the keyboard, and a portal formed next to her guest. Lin Yunfei, smiling awkwardly with just the corners of his lips, promised to return as quickly as he could and entered the graciously provided portal. In an instant, Lin Yunfei was in the Valley of the Healing King, having come here through a portal. The sight that appeared before his eyes was unexpected to the sage. The hut, which had a sign that said that it was free of charge, was surrounded by crowds. The man hummed in surprise. It had been a long time since he had last visited this place, but when had the valley become so popular? Suddenly, there was a rude voice telling someone to get lost because a certain gentleman needed to be examined by a doctor. The sage turned around and saw a rich gentleman being carried in a luxurious palanquin, and the man who was rudely telling someone to go away was standing in front. The rude servant was pointed out for his ignorance. And indeed, to get in front when there was a lively queue was simply impossible rudeness, but the one who was pointed out was not particularly impressed. 
he picked his little finger in his ear and smirked, calling all the people present a nigger who had no right to tell his honorable master about the rules of the queue. People were naturally indignant. They had already waited a very long time for the reception, observing the proper rules of decorum. The disgusting man had an answer to that, too. His opinion was that all these rules were invented for the nobles, but not for the lord, for he was a very important man, and therefore his servant could easily beat any of them to death and still not be held responsible for this atrocity. Then the man bent his arm at the elbow, and the skin on it began to turn to stone. He swung his literally stone fist, about to strike someone in line. People scattered with screams, and some, not having time to react otherwise, simply covered themselves in terror with their hands and helplessly awaited the blow. The wise man who was watching this unjust spectacle clucked his tongue. He applied a time stop and approached the servant who had attacked the innocent people. Lin Yun Fai briefly flicked the frozen stone hand. Waves of energy dispersed in circles from the man, and he stepped away from the unfolding action, heading towards the hut. As Lin Yunfei walked up the steps and disappeared into the room behind the canopy, time regained its flow. The people, who had shrunk in anticipation of the blow, froze in surprise. They all saw that the Ambo's arm was twisted at an unnatural angle, and he cried out in pain. His important lord in the palanquin asked angrily, who dared to do that to his servant? And then he noticed something strange. Those who were carrying the luxurious palanquin on their shoulders suddenly turned around, as if in a trance, and hurriedly began to carry their master away from the hut. Even desperate threats of dismissal had no effect on them. The people breathed a sigh of relief as they followed the palanquin with glances. In the hut, a girl was sitting in front of the bed, covered in a green glow. In the hut, a girl with a green glow was sitting in front of the bed, levitating above the bed. Lian Xin, embraced by the faint glow of the spiritual energy being used, was sitting in front of the bed, above which an unconscious patient was levitating at a certain height. The doctor was performing a complicated operation, wielding scalpels that she controlled with a special technique. It was obvious from the girl's face how tense it was to perform all the manipulations, because it was necessary to act with jeweler's precision. Finally, the scalpel snatched the tumor outward, severing it from the body, and sent the piece of flesh onto the metal tray. The operation was complete, and the instruments returned to their rightful places. The doctor exhaled in relief and wiped her soaked forehead with her hand. Behind her, a familiar male voice suddenly sounded, causing her eyes to round in amazement. The girl turned around. Lin Yunfei himself was approaching her with a leisurely gait. He was surprised by the excitement here. The girl blossomed and asked the sage about the purpose of his visit. The doctor, in turn, smiled and gave her sister's whereabouts. She advised him to simply look in the valley. The man nodded gratefully and then pointed towards the street where the coups were lined up. He still couldn't understand the reason for the sudden crowd, because as far as Lin Yunfei could remember, it was a rule that the Healing King's Valley only accepted people with untreatable or fatal diseases. It was hard to see such people in a year and a few, but then why was it so bad now? The girl smiled, got up from the floor, and walked over to her interlocutor. She simply explained that this rule was indeed being broken by her own volition right now, after all, Lion Sin was a doctor, and if she had the opportunity to help more people, it was worth it to compromise on such prohibitions. She had realized this when she had met Lin Yunfei himself in the past. The man praised his friend for her hard work and ruffled her soft hair. However, there was not one line outside the door to the hut, but two? What did that mean? The doctor blushed lowering her embarrassed gaze to the floor. She exhaled and said that often, during the free appointments, some people came to confess their love on behalf of the clinic. She can't even refuse all these men, carrying luxurious bouquets of flowers for the doctor. Therefore, to make the reception work more efficient, Lion Xin told all the people who wanted to confess their love to her that if they wanted to share their feelings, they were not allowed to get in without queuing. They must all wait in another queue and then after the girl was free from her main job, she could again reject all the men one by one. The wise man who heard this was somewhat confused. These people are really too persistent to come again and again, only to be sent away again and again with a refusal. The doctor pouted her lips and furrowed her thin eyebrows. 
What annoyed her about the situation was that these grooms smelled like males in heat, and they had only bad intentions in their heads. They only look at the face, not knowing the doctor at all, but for some reason, they say they like her. Lin Yunfei advised his acquaintance to continue examining the patient and not to worry about the grieving groomsman, as the sage would be able to handle it. The girl happily began to thank him, grabbing his hand and pressing her whole body against him. The man slightly pulled Lian Xin away from him, placing a finger on her forehead and once again told her to continue examining the patients. Meanwhile, there was a commotion in the very motley queue of men with expensive bouquets of flowers. Their feet glowed faintly, and then all those who wished to declare their love for the doctor turned in the opposite direction as if on cue and headed away. They were completely out of control of their lower limbs, moving farther and farther away from the hut. The rest of the people, having seen such a sight for the second time, could only scratch the back of their heads in bewilderment. Lim Yunfei headed to the entrance of the Valley of the Healing King, one of the five secret places in China. If one entered it without a guide, he would surely get lost and only death awaited him. The mystery of this place has not yet been solved. The man moved through the dense shroud of fog, and soon came to a body of water by which the sought-after Bai Haixin was sitting with her back to her guest. Lin Yunfei saw Bai Haixin's back and scratched his cheek with his fingernail in confusion. The woman was the only person in the celestial realm that he dared not look into her eyes, so the sage sat down opposite her at the stone table, his head down, staring down at her. Still, he furtively looked into the face of Bai Haixin, who remained just as beautiful. She looked back at him calmly and with a half-smile on her delicate lips. Unable to bear the eye contact, Lin Yunfei turned his head to the side. Bai Haixin took one seed that was lying in a pile at the bottom of the plate and threw it into the grass on the ground. In just a few moments, the seed glowed and turned first into a small sprout, then into a nice shoot with flowers, and from one of them grew a weighty, striped fruit. It snapped off the stem and began to float above the table where Bai Haixin and the sage were actually sitting. The woman waved her hand, and the fruit was instantly cut into individual lobes that spread out in a circle. In between, she asked Lin Yunfei about the reason why he continued to act so shy around her. Was it that she instilled such terror that even a great sage was afraid to face her? Lin Yunfei tensely watched the actions of his interlocutor. He realized that this was a lotus soul reincarnation. Indeed, nothing could satisfy this woman. Bai Haixin continued to speak. She felt that his holiness should not feel any sense of indebtedness for her own decision in their shared past. The sage continued to be uncomfortable, and he avoided looking in the woman's direction as much as he could. Not only was he experiencing an abominable stiffness, but he couldn't sense Bai Haixin's thoughts for some unknown reason. This was causing him to be somewhat confused. The woman shook her head and took a piece of fruit with both hands, which turned out to be filled with red pulp with flecks of seeds, and handed it to the sage. She calmed the inwardly thrashing Lin Yunfei. The man could actually sense her thoughts, it was just that the woman didn't have an excess of them. When thoughts arise, Bai Haixin immediately denounces them into words, so the sage perceives what she feels and what she says. There is no difference. Lin Yunfei accepted a piece of fruit from the woman's hands, a little embarrassed. He tasted the red pulp and gazed at the food in surprise. It turned out to be surprisingly very sweet and delicious. Bai Haixin called this mysterious fruit a watermelon, which seemed to have once existed 500 years ago. It was recently found by two little kids in a strange place in the valley. The man looked around incomprehensively. What kind of babies? Since when were babies present in the valley? He didn't know that. Bai Haixin squinted slyly and pointed her finger behind Lin Yunfei's back with a smile. The man slanted his gaze. Suddenly, a ringing childish voice sounded from behind him. He suddenly called the unfortunate sage father. From surprise, the sage even spat out the entire contents of his mouth. This caused small watermelon seeds to fly towards Bai Haixin. The man barely had time to apply the yin-yang control technique to avoid even more humiliation. The seeds stopped a very minuscule distance away from his interlocutor's face. Lin Yunfei, on the other hand, stood up. Slowly, he turned around, afraid of what he might see there. When he did, 
he was once again stunned. Running towards him, frozen in time, was a joyful pink-cheeked girl with the same hair color as himself. The sage turned away again with the most mixed feelings. Was it again? Lin Yunfei vigorously shook his head, trying to calm down and shake off his excitement. After all, this was not the first time this had happened to him recently, so why was he reacting so violently again? By all laws of science, he should have adapted to this after experiencing a flurry of shocks. The man took a deep breath. He tried his best to regain his composure so that he would at least not look foolish in front of Bai Haixin. After a while of controlling his breathing, the sage still found the strength to raise his head and look the woman frozen in space and time in the eyes. He canceled the specific actions with a slice of watermelon, which was now back in Bai Haixin's hands. The woman who had regained the ability to move looked around incomprehensibly and then at the berry. Bai Haixin understood exactly what kind of technique the sage had used and was convinced how unprecedented and unrivaled it was. Lin Yunfei pointed behind his back where the frozen child was and wondered at everything that was going on. No matter how much he tried to keep his face under control, it still gave away the man's confusion. Bai Haixin replied calmly, This child is their daughter, Lian Sheng. However, the sage had no idea how did this even happen. Once again, Lin Yunfei remembered absolutely nothing about a child being conceived from him, and this pattern was even frightening. It made the man drench himself in sweat. The woman did not understand her guest's feelings. She clearly sensed that the sage had been constantly having sudden encounters in the last few days. It was time to get used to it at least a little, instead of uniformly violent reactions to each regular meeting with her child. Bai Haixin lowered her gaze to the flower she had created. The sole reincarnation, the seeds born from the lotus, she had a reason why she didn't tell Lin Yunfei anything. He understood better than her. Only the man knew what she was thinking, but here was the woman herself who couldn't even guess at his thoughts. These events took place seven years ago. China was still in chaos. Each side was coming up with their own cunning plans. There was no trust. Today you are together, and tomorrow you are betrayed. The good brothers and comrades around Lin Yunfei, who shared his ideals, continued to die on the battlefield. Until he was the only one of them left. The road ahead was as dark as night, and the future sage's heart had run out of kerosene. Everyone appeared to be dead. Anger and sorrow engulfed Lin Yunfei, and his thunderous cry cut through the heavens. Kill all those who brought war to the Middle Kingdom. Kill all those who betrayed the letter of the law. Kill all those who divide the country and divide the land. Kill all those who have evil intentions. The day Lin Yunfeng went mad with grief, he became the true god of death of China. There were so many people with evil designs that the man couldn't stop killing, from south to north, east to west, constantly destroying them. The more he killed, the more vast became that mountain of corpses beneath him, the more desperate he became. The more he lost hope, the deeper he fell into the very depths of madness. The blood moon rose over the death-stricken China. At that time, Bai Haixin of the Pure Mind sect appeared in front of Lin Yunfei, who was shrouded in darkness. He didn't know why she appeared before him, a bloodthirsty monster. To the laconic reply that the girl had come to help, Lin Yunfei only chuckled. Pure Mind Buddhists come to the world to seek Buddha. What did they care about the world? Back then, Lin Yunfei sincerely felt that Bai Haixin's help was completely unnecessary to him. Bai Haixin, treading carefully with her bare feet on the lotus-shaped seals, approached Lin Yunfei. Now that the heavenly kingdom was united, everyone was eager to get rid of the mad god of death as soon as possible. He had turned the whole world against him. Was this what Lin Yunfei wanted? This question escaped the lips of the girl who wanted to lend a helping hand. However, they didn't say anything to her, but instead told Bai Haixin to get away, because this time, she would stay alive. To this, the girl found something to reply. Since there was no threat to her life, it didn't matter whether she left or stayed, but at the same moment, an ominous he flew near her ear with a deadly arrow. It was a warning that if she didn't leave, she would die. But the threat did not succeed. Bai Haixin moved closer in defiance. Lin Yunfei was indignant. 
This stubborn girl had devoted her entire life to virtue, and now she was willing to part with it so easily. He was like an angry beast cornered in a corner, trying not to let anyone get close to him, growling warningly and baring his fangs. But this did not frighten by Hakeson. The man in front of her took the path of darkness in the name of the people. She was willing to give up any virtues for him. Lin Yunfi gritted his teeth. He muttered that he was only doing this to avenge his comrades, and that he didn't care about the heavenly realm. The girl spread her arms out to the sides, revealing herself completely, and offered to kill her right then and there. But instead, the fearsome god of death of China backed away, and the girl stepped closer and stood on her toes. Their lips came together in a kiss. She applied the Heart Sutra. Lotus of Rebirth and the madness that was clouding the future sage's eyes dissipated, as did the ominous dark key. Lin Yunfei, finally free of this rage and anger, cried sincerely and then collapsed with his back on the ground. The sage already in the future, whereby Hakeson was telling all this, raised his eyebrows in incomprehension. What is it? Is it possible to have children from a simple kiss now? Bai Hakeson shrieked, covering her lips with her palm. She never seemed to have mentioned what happened next. The woman hurriedly rectified this and spoke. On the day of their kiss, Lin Yunfei's dark Kai had dissipated, but he was not showing signs of life. Without urgent medical intervention, the man would surely die. Realizing this, Bai Hakeson immediately carried them both to the Healing King Valley and sought Lion Kton's help. The sage hummed thoughtfully. That said, it explained that he had already woken up in Lion Kton's hut. But what did Bai Hakeson do to him afterward? It turned out that after the ritual, the girl was already carrying a future child under her heart. Under Lion Kton's supervision, Bai Hakeson used her clan's secret technique of continuous regeneration on the man. This extremely dangerous technique recreates and regenerates the body and soul. By mistake, she gave Lin Yunfei a power that is incomparable to either the past or the future. There was silence. The sage thought about what he had heard, frowning. However, he did not ponder for a long time, postponing his thoughts for a better time. Instead, the man asked Bai Hakeson a very logical question. If the girl knows her father, why didn't her mother bring her to see him? The woman covered her eyes and shook her head. It wasn't that it was impossible, not even for safety reasons, and certainly not for Bai Hakeson's personal reluctance. Unfortunately, the daughter only had one year left to live. Lin Yunfei involuntarily opened his mouth when he heard Bai Hakeson's words. His daughter only had one year to live. The woman had originally thought that there was no more than half a year left at all. This was because Lian Sheng was born with a strange ailment and a wound on her body. The bleeding from the wound did not stop, and then the worried mother brought her daughter to the Valley of the Healing King to Lian Xin. This disease is called glass body, and alas, there is no cure for it. When the girl's body is deprived of enough blood, she will die. The sage clenched his fists until his knuckles were white. He turned his head, looking at his daughter, who had frozen. A carefree smile continued to show on the child's face. Lin Yunfei turned away, frowning. Bai Hakeson explained the situation further. Unfortunately, even Lion Sen couldn't do anything about this illness, even though they had been looking for a way to help the child for a long time. The illness was also accompanied by occasional severe heart and lung pains, but in her entire life, Lion Sheng had never once complained about it to her mother. She didn't want to make her worry about herself. On Bai Hakeson's cheek, a lone tear of grief streaked a wet path. Uncontrollably, the same thing happened to Lin Yunfei. He lowered his head low in an attempt to hide his tear-stained gaze and covered his face with his palm. Truly, the Lotus of Rebirth had brought a lot of grief. The tears of an inconsolable mother, knowing that her precious child was doomed to die at the beginning of her life, were completely understandable to the sage. So he asked for permission to express his pain and sympathy as a grown man. Bai Hakeson's eyes became more and more filled with tears. She tried to keep her face straight, making her appear even more sorrowful. Lin Yunfei couldn't just look at this and stand idly by. He resolutely jumped up from his seat. The man was going to track down all the healers in the Celestial Empire and bring them here 
and if they were so cruel and refused, no problem, he would tie them up and deliver them by force. Doctors all over the world would search for a cure for his daughter's illness, and even if necessary, Lin Yunfei would ascend to heaven and descend to the very depths of the underworld to cure his child. It was decided he was going to help Lion Shen recover at all costs. And now, and now my daughter would rather just be hugged. The man finally restored the passage of time for the girl. She ran to him with joyful exclamations that she already liked her daddy very much. The man held out his arms to her, crouching down on one knee. He dispersed his protective chi, going to embrace his daughter gently and softly, without a drop of force. Lian Sheng finally found herself in her father's arms, hugging her fragile arms tightly around his neck. Lin Yunfei gently pressed the child against him, placing his palm on her narrow back. He apologized to his daughter for making him wait so long. Lian Sheng then asked to ride her on her neck, as she had been wanting to do so for a long time. How could she say no to that? As well as the request to fly together. And so father and daughter soared into the air with the happy laughter of children. Lian Sheng, on the other hand, suddenly looked at the man with her charming eyes and asked him to get the star, just as the sage had done for big sister Chadong. She said that she had seen it happen. Lin Yunfei turned to Bai Haixin questioningly. Was it possible for their daughter to see something that she essentially couldn't? The woman smiled. The heavenly order was amazing. It took away one thing, but gave something else in return. The little girl is smart beyond her years. Even when she stays at home, she always knows what's going on outside. The daughter was not omniscient, for her abilities are different from that status. It could be said that she is omniscient. Without leaving the valley, she is able to see everything that happens outside of it, including how the sage gave his other daughter a star. Lin Yunfei looked up to where his daughter was sitting on his neck and asked the little girl if she was really omniscient. The little girl nodded her head vigorously. She had seen how handsome daddy was, and that Akshala was cool to her, since he beat up all, all the bad uncles who were bullying Xuan Xuan's big sister. The man, hearing such childish speeches, simply could not remain indifferent, and his heart warmed. He could surprise this little girl so easily. Then Lian Sheng unexpectedly asked if Achala could help her catch the bird. He was obviously not meant for such purposes, but it was beyond the sage's strength to refuse his daughter. Bai Haixin, who was peacefully watching such a touching father-daughter bonding scene, stood up from her seat. She was going to check on the Yi family while the man stayed with the child. If she made any progress in this matter, she would let them know. Lian Sheng guessed that her mother was on her way to help big sister Yao. The woman gave her daughter a final smile and patted her leg lightly. Lin Yunfei opened a portal straight to the Yi family for Bai Haixin, and the woman entered while her daughter waved goodbye to her. The sage picked up the girl in his arms. It was time for them to get busy catching a bird. Lian Xin, already relieved from helping her many patients, was strolling through the valley. Suddenly, the girl was stopped by loud sounds and a giant shadow that fell on her and covered the ground in the neighborhood. A majestic Achala towered in front of Lian Xin, and next to it, Lin Yunfei hovered in the air with his daughter in his arms. The sage pointed at a bird flying very close by. He ordered to catch it, but only with his fingers, so as not to inadvertently crush the fragile creature. Achala obeyed. His powerful arms swept out, catching the bird in a field of blue with his index finger and thumb. The frightened prey would not have had time to fly away from such long limbs if it had wanted to. My daughter waved her arms happily. It looked really cool to her. Lian Xin shouted from the ground, folding her palms together, that since Lin Yunfei had not left yet, he could stay for dinner. The sage didn't refuse, as he hadn't tasted his friend's cooking for a long time. The man descended to the ground with his daughter, followed by the blue ball with the bird inside. It then moved to Lin Yunfei's hand, resting comfortably on his broad palm. The daughter did not fail to brag about their loot to Auntie Lian Xin. The doctor's eyes lit up at the sight of the cute, well-fed bird. Lian Xin's behavior was reminiscent of a child, which the sage informed her unkindly. But the girl frowned, turning away. And she's not little at all already. Lian Xin had even become a mother. The daughter immediately confirmed this, 
and said that Brother Zhu was very lucky to have a mother. Lin Yunfei was slightly confused. When did his friend have time to become a mother? However, since that was the case, the man was going to give her a red envelope. Wayan Xin, because of the different customs here, didn't realize that the red envelope in the outside world was used to congratulate friends who had children. The man had to explain, but the girl brushed it off. She did not recognize such traditions. Suddenly, there was a very suspicious loud sound from the side of the hut that silenced the group. They synchronously turned around at the sound. Smoke was billowing from under the thatched roof of Lion Xin's dwelling. Lion Sheng started repeating Zhu Zi's name, hinting at the culprit of the escaping smoke. Lion Xin, scared to death for her son, immediately rushed to the hut. In a moment, the sage had already disappeared from his seat next to his daughter and appeared in front of his friend with the boy in his arms. The boy was abrasion and unconscious. Lion Xin, in a couple of steps, was next to her, began to ask her son to wake up and not to frighten his mother. Lion Sheng was also worried about her brother's health. But the wise man reassured them both. The child was stunned but not injured, nothing life-threatening. Lion Xin looked worriedly first at her son and then at the man, not knowing whether to believe the sage's words or not. Lin Yunfei reminded her that she was a doctor after all. The girl looked down in embarrassment. She did have extensive medical knowledge and had treated hopeless ailments on many occasions, but the feelings in her eyes were dulling her common sense. Lion Xin did her best to calm herself down. She took Zhu Zi's hand and pressed the place where the artery ran and listened to the pulse, a standard way of diagnosis. While she was counting Zhu Zi's heartbeats, she didn't even breathe. Then she plopped down on her feet in the grass and rubbed her forehead, exhaling tiredly. The girl assured herself that the baby was fine. However, worry was replaced by anger. She had told Zhu Zi so many times not to play with strange things, but he never really listened to her. This was the second time the boy had frightened his mother like this. She frowned and promised to give Zhu Zhe an educational talk when he woke up. Lian Sheng tried to defend her big brother, after all, he's doing such wonderful things that weren't even outside. That's pretty cool after all. However, Lian Xian stubbornly lifted her chin. What's the point of being cool? It doesn't cure diseases or save lives. The brat doesn't even want to study medicine with his mother, and after all, the knowledge of the healing King Valley should be passed down through inheritance. While the doctor was righteously indignant and complaining about her negligent son, Lin Yunfei slanted his eyes. Su Zi had already regained his senses and was looking at him with interest. The child asked if he was his daddy. The sage, who at first did not see the trick, smiled and confirmed the words. It was only after a couple of seconds that the man got the point. He darted his eyes around. He was thrown into a cold sweat. Lin Yunfei threw his son upwards in surprise. Very high, so high that the boy found himself orbiting the planet. However, the son was not frightened at all, but even laughed and marveled at his father's incredible strength. Lin Xin stammered and asked Lin Yunfei what was wrong with him. The man looked at his hands in complete shock. His friend told him to catch Zhu Zi as soon as possible, because he would crash. The sage folded his palm to palm of his hand and created a heavenly pillar that flew far into the sky. Zhu Zi landed right on top of it. The surface of the column was very soft, even springy. The child looked down with interest. He could even see the healing King Valley from there, but it seemed so insignificant compared to the rest of the vast world. Wow. Lian Xin ordered to bring the child down sooner, and the man obeyed. The column began to shrink in height. Zhu Zini, on the other hand, calling the sage pope again, shouted that he wanted to roll down from such a height, and to do so, he needed to make a slide. No less frightened than Lian Xin, Lin Yunfei agreed to make his son a slide. Immediately, the slide snaked around the pillar, wrapping around it in a circle. Zhu Zi joyfully raised his hands laughing and jumped onto the slide, immediately rolling down it rapidly. He was not intimidated by the height or the speed. The world looked incredible to him, as incredible as his father had made it for his son. The sage was waiting at the end of the slide with his arms out. He prepared to catch the boy. The child landed right into the man's hands. 
Su Zain laughed again and asked him to do it again, because it was so beautiful up there. He would like to see such a sight again. Lion Sheng, who saw her brother's delight, also wanted to try it. Now they were begging their common father with a chorus. Lin Yunfei was terrified at the prospect of experiencing this again, but he didn't refuse the children. Instead, he froze time for them and stepped back. Zhu Zi hovered in mid-air, and his mother, Lian Xin, was grabbed by the sage's hand and led away, striding swiftly and even angrily. The doctor was amazed at the technique of stopping time and leaving children so still. She hadn't seen it before. Lin Yunfei brushed it off and asked not to stray from the main topic of conversation. Just now, Lian Xin's son called the sage his dad. How could this be understood? The girl smiled sweetly and said that he was indeed his father, so there was nothing surprising about it. The man turned away from his friend, almost desperate. He still hadn't gotten used to it, even though he should be used to it after so many times. It didn't matter whether Lin Yunfei remembered the moment of conception or not. It seemed like he had been taken advantage of again. Still, he had to calm down and continue the conversation with a cool head. It wasn't good to just stand there and make a big deal out of it. So the sage took a deep breath and exhaled. We need to find out the reason. That should clear things up and set things straight. Lin Yunfei turned to Lian Xin, once again wondering how they had a child. The doctor explained, when big sis Bai Haixin sought her help to save a man, Lian Xin borrowed some of his yang. It was necessary to investigate the negative effects of the lotus rebirth ritual. The thing is, just as in ancient times, Sheng Nam, the patron god of medicine, tested various medicinal herbs on himself, the girl uses her body to benefit the sick man. Lin Yun Fei furrowed his brows. The sage's face twisted in horror. Did you remember to ask him in this situation? The friend wrinkled her nose a little and folded her lips into a tube. Actually, she asked his permission, and he didn't refuse her. To be more precise, the man didn't make a sound at all, so Lion Xin thought that silence was a sign of consent. Then he lay unconscious in her cabin. She sat at his side on her lap and folded her palm to palm. For the sake of every barren sibling in this world, Lion Xin was willing to use her own body, but it also required a man. Except she had never been married, and the only male person she had managed to meet at that moment was Lin Yunfei. Of course, Lian Xin did ask permission to use Yang back then, but what good was it? Lin Yunfei was lying unconscious at that moment, and certainly couldn't answer. In the end, the doctor clapped her hands happily and considered the silence a sign of agreement. The wise man had no words for it. Honestly, he was filled with righteous horror, and shuddered as he imagined how it might have happened. After all, the man had been used again. Lian Xin's conscience was clearly not troubled, because she reacted to her interlocutor's confusion with a smile and a hug. She clung to him gratefully, because back then, with his help, she had managed to find a medicine that Big Sister Yi said was quite effective. Wasn't that a miracle? The sage covered his face with his palm. His friend's goal was very noble, and the result was good, but the method she used. For that, he grabbed Lian Xin's both cheeks and pulled them away, instructing her to never make such important decisions alone again. The girl rubbed her injured cheeks and agreed. Besides, she now had Zhu Zi, which made Lian Xin very happy, and because Bai Haixin had also used the Lotus of Rebirth, the valley became very lively. She was no longer lonely like she was after her mentor's death. However, Lian Xin feels that all her efforts are meaningless. There are some things that even the Lotus of Rebirth is unable to cure. And Zhu Zi doesn't listen to his mother at all. He does not want to practice medicine, always busy with some strange things, according to the doctor, and absolutely refuses to adopt the art of healing the Valley of the King of Healing. She could use the help of the father of their common son, by the way. Lim Yun Fei exhaled while covering his eyes. He had told Lian Xin what he thought was right. His parents once thought that their son should study calligraphy and martial arts, but he only carried a stick and caused trouble for everyone around him. Later, Lin Yunfei embarked on the path of martial arts. In those troubled times, he fought with his martial brothers without sparing his life, killing left and right, and thus laid the foundation for the stability of the heavenly state.
Although she and Lan Sen don't have much parenting experience, but it should be understood that a child should not strive to fulfill all the hopes and desires of parents. The most important teacher on the path of life is interest. If Zhu Zai is so passionate about something, they, as parents, only have to fully support him in it. There was a grain of reason in the sage's words, and Lian Xen couldn't disagree with him. On the other hand, if the son followed his own path, what would happen to the legacy of the Healing King's Valley? And to this question, Lin Yunfei had a suitable idea. Since Lian Xen had already broken the rule of the valley by starting to accept patients for free, perhaps it was worth opening a medical school. By passing on the knowledge to more people, she would save many more lives than she could on her own. The Middle Kingdom is still recovering from the post-war devastation, and disease abounds among the people. The people need skilled healers more than ever before. The capital is about to establish a court medical institute. Lin Yunfei was sure that there was no more worthy candidate than Xian Lin to lead the institution. The girl looked unsure of her abilities. However, if the man said so, she was ready to try. Lian Xin hugged the dazed Lin Yunfei, but immediately pulled away and went to the hut to prepare dinner for all of them. The sage stayed behind to look after the children. He returned to his original position and took his son in his arms. The children froze and continued to beg their father to repeat the dizzying ride for them. Lin Yunfei agreed and lowered his son from his arms to the ground. He created a floating cloud that carried them high up to the delighted squeals of the children. Lin Yunfei put his hand out in front of him, causing a gust of wind. The cloud on which the children were standing soared upwards. Originally, this kind of cloud technique was used to conceal squads of soldiers and thus ensure surprise attacks. Entire armies could hide in the sky. The sage, however, was going to modify it a bit right now. He asked the children to keep a close eye on it. The man had combined heaven-defying and expanding techniques into a cloud dream under a peaceful sky. As soon as Lin Yunfei said this, the cloud began to rapidly spread across the sky. A huge air castle was lining up on it. It really looked spectacular, so the children's mouths dropped open and their eyes lit up with joy. A whole cloud city appeared before them. The father patted the children on the top of their heads and sent them off to play. Everything in these clouds is soft, so there was complete safety and absolutely no injuries. Every parent's dream. Zhu Zi and Lian Sheng raced towards the slides, leaving the man behind. They laughed as they played amongst the clouds, rolling down the soft slides and jumping high. They were certainly making a lot of noise, but it was no big deal. Lin Yunfei looked at the endlessly joyful little ones, and his lips stretched into a smile of their own. It was for the sake of this beautiful, peaceful picture that he and his brothers had put their lives on the line. Children are the future of this world, and for their sake, the wise man will purify it from chaos, darkness, malice, and hatred. Lian Xin, who remained on the ground, had just finished their food. The girl set the fragrant dishes on the table and turned around to the cloud castle. She shouted out, inviting the children and Lin Yunfei for dinner. In the same instant, a slide lined up from Cloud City straight to the ground near the hut. Zhu Zhe, Lian Sheng, and Lin Yunfei descended it with the appearance of the happiest people in this world. Soon, they all sat down at the same table and started eating. They had a casual conversation full of questions from Zhu Zhe. He wondered how true the claim that his father was the strongest man in the world was. Xian Lin stretched her lips into a tube. Lin Yunfei is indeed a very strong person, but she doesn't know much about the outside world, and there's no way she can answer her son's question accurately enough. Lian Shen came to Xian Lin's rescue. Bai Haixin, the girl's mom, had told her that in battles and battles, her dad was unrivaled, but otherwise, he wasn't that good. Especially in dealing with girls. In love affairs, as she put it, the wise man is first from the end. This, also coming from the children's lips, definitely pricked the man, who turned sharply pale. But Han Lin, instead of smoothing things over for the father of her child, instead added kindling to the fire of this humiliation. The girl agreed that the sage was bad at lovemaking, and in general, in general, in dealing with women, because when he first came to his senses seven years ago, he was very timid. 
Lin Yunfei couldn't even talk to them, neither Bai Haixin nor Lian Xin. His entire face had turned red back then. The girl thought it was very cute. Sage, trying to maintain some pride, asked not to rake up the past and humiliate him in the eyes of his own children. Fortunately, Zhu Zi changed the subject. He needed help with something. He and Lian Sheng had discovered a secret base. It's full of seeds and books written with ancient texts inside, and there's also something like a shiny thing. Also, the wall in the secret base can talk, and all those amazing things that Zhu Zi created, he learned how to do from that thing. Lin Yunfei pondered for a moment. During the wartime, ancient relics 500 years old had been discovered in several places. They were mostly large pillars, but no one had been able to decipher the ancient texts and understand their purpose. Judging by the children's descriptions, the local relics have their own differences. Zuzi asked his father to rescue their friend, who taught the children ancient language and writing. He's trapped in a magic room and can't get out, and Lion Sin and Bai Haixin can't think of anything to save him. And since Daddy is the strongest in the world, who, if not him, can help. Lin Yunfei stood up from the table, ready to go and see this mysterious friend in need of help together. The children jumped joyfully and led the man up the mountain, holding his hand. They arrived at the place soon enough and found themselves at the rock. Lin Yunfei was distracted by touching the rock, but the children meanwhile quickly ran straight into the wall and passed through it, leaving blue streaks on the rock. The sage raised his eyebrows in surprise. His eyes lit up and he used a technique that made his true appearance appear. Thanks to this, the huge entrance to the cave, disguised by someone skillful as a rock imitation, became visible. How extraordinary! Without the revealing technique, it would be difficult for a man to find such a place, so how could ordinary children do it? That's the question. To the son and daughter, there was nothing surprising about the false wall. Zuzai looked out altogether and called out to his father to hurry inside. Lin Yunfei put his hands behind his back as always and walked through the rock illusion. In front of him was a high-tech corridor with niches with seeds and embryos on the walls. Near one of these the sage lingered. The inscription on a glass capsule with several embryos read, African Elephant. The sage hummed thoughtfully and turned his head. His gaze came across other flasks, but with algae and plant seeds. Lin Yunfei walked onward. In the wide room that the corridor led to, there were already children waving their hands, beckoning the man over. Next to them stood a strange girl. She was the one who had caught the sage's attention. Perhaps this was the friend the children were talking about. However, the girl seemed somehow immovable. Zhu Zi suddenly stretched out his hand and tapped his knuckles on the stranger's leg. There was a resounding metallic ringing sound. His son explained that it never moved, and Bai Haixin looked at it and generally said that she had never seen anything like it, and that it was the legacy of an ancient civilization. Lin Yunfei applied the unbounded all-seeing eye technique and scanned the children's strange friend, this humanoid puppet from the time of the ancient civilization. Her structure had nothing in common with the current models. There was no soul connected to it, no etheric component that should control its movements. Yunfen and her children in a laboratory hidden in a cave, looks around, sees the bodies of a man and a woman inside mechanisms that look like boxes with glass lids. In the woman's hands is a photo. The photo shows three people, her, the man, his body is in a neighboring mechanism, and a young girl with blue hair. The sage is reasoning. This man has passed away a long time ago. Surprisingly, the body has not yet undergone decomposition. The capabilities of this mechanism surpass even icy tombs. BEP. A huge screen on the wall turns on. The girl from the photo appears on the screen, addressing the children and saying that Zhu Zi and Lian Sheng have returned. The children run toward the monitor with exclamation. Lin Gang's big sister. The kids say calling their daddy to help her. Yun Feng recognized the girl. He had just seen her in the picture in the hands of the woman's body in the mechanism behind the glass. The girl is surprised and thanks the children for bringing their father. She notices Yun Feng and says he is quite attractive. The children happily confirm. Aha! Daddy is the best. The sage asks the girl what substance she has been imprisoned in. Why doesn't he feel a bit of spiritual energy here? 
The girl replies that this is only her virtual projection. Her real body is locked away on the lower level in a special chamber. Yunfeng is perplexed. Virtual projection, what is that, an illusion? An incarnation of a soul that has left the body. The girl says that the world has changed so much in these 500 years. He didn't understand a single word she said, and his words seem like complete nonsense to her. Zhu Zi explains to his father, it's not an illusion, it's called a screen or display. 500 years ago, the people of the elder sister could use it to communicate with each other at a distance of thousands of li. The sage is baffled. This contraption could transmit sound over such distances. Were there really those in this world who could achieve such a thing? Lian Sheng says that Big Sis Lin tells them about so many interesting things. About mathematical integration, children's stories, automation, and electricity. All the amazing things that Brother Zuzi is mastering, all taught by Big Sis Lin. Yunfeng reasoned, Is this the technology of the civilization that ended the era of law? Suddenly, interference appeared on the screen and began to intensify. The girl on the screen twisted in pain. The boy is frightened. What's wrong with his big sister? Looks like their big sister won't be able to keep the kids company anymore. Rez, the energy reserve in the base would soon come to an end. Her body won't last much longer. The children are screaming. Big sis? No. They beg their father to help her. The sage calms them down and asks them to wipe away their tears, says that dad will surely think of something. Asks the girl how he can help her. Lane's older little sister has tears in her eyes. No need to help her, she doesn't have long left. Having Zhu Zi and Lian Shang by her side in the last moments of her life is already enough. The boy tearfully asks his father to get her out of here soon. He says that his mom's omnipotent healing techniques will definitely help his little sister. Yun Feng wonders to the girl why she is imprisoned in this place. There is heavy interference on the screen, the girl narrates. Five hundred years ago, the world was engulfed in a war in which almost all of humanity was wiped out. Lin ended up here with her parents. They were just trying to escape a disaster, but were discovered by the enemy side. Her mom and dad locked her in the safest room possible. Lane remembers screaming through the glass and begging her parents to let her out of there. She wants to stay with them. Her father puts his hand to the glass, calls his daughter baby, and says she won't be in any danger there, and asks to continue to live for her and her mom. Her parents turn around and leave the room. They have guns in their hands. The door closes. Lin hears the sound of gunshots. She cries. And then it's all a blur, like a dream that never ends. The girl doesn't know how much time passed before she came to her senses. Mom and dad are gone. There was no one to let her out. Her only regret is that she couldn't leave with her parents. The girl continues to cry. Lion Sheng is sobbing. Big sister. No. Xu Zi is asking his father to think of something. He's so strong. The sage crouches down, strokes his children's heads, and calms them down. All right, all right. He says he also wants to learn more about these technologies. Asks the children to take him to her. The kids run and call out for their father, asking him to go hurry. Hurry up. The interference on the screen stopped. Lin crossed her arms over her chest. Watching them walk away slyly, she smiled. Yun Fen and the children approached the glass door of the room where the older little sister Lin is. The boy points his finger and tells his father that she is guarded by something terribly dangerous and strange. Neither his mother nor Aunt Hai Xin could get through there. The sage looks carefully through the glass door inside the room, then touches the children's heads. Yi Zhu Zi and Lian Sheng float in the air protected by a yellow aura. Yun Feng asks them to wait outside and tells them that Dad will handle this for now. The boy wishes his father good luck. The girl asks him to be careful. The sage shows a raised thumb up and says, Okay. Yun Fen walks into a room behind a glass door. He is surrounded on all sides by laser beams. The sage casts an incantation. Solid as a diamond, and passes through. The lasers disappear. Suddenly, from all four corners of the passageway, the sage just passed. Some sort of weapon emerges. They shoot into the center and combine their beams turning them into one huge one. That beam flies into the sage's back.
and explodes colliding with the barrier behind Yun Feng's back. He is surprised and ponders, what kind of technique is this? Its power is enough to break through the first level of his defense, Format Hatu. Pronounces, translate. A black ball appears behind his back taller than the sage's height. This ball absorbed the huge beam flying at him and dissolved into thin air. Yun Feng goes to the door and knocks on it. Knock, knock. The material of this door is one of the rarest in the world, extremely strong. If you strike it directly, the person inside will also be hit. Squats down and thinks, hmm, what to do? Hits the floor with his fist with force. There is a loud sound that travels a long distance in different directions. The children, Zhu Zi and Lian Sheng, hovering in the air protected by a yellow aura not far from the rock where the laboratory-like room is located, hear a loud sound from there. The boy asks Lian Sheng to check on dad and little sister Lin. Are they not in trouble? The girl stares intently in that direction, her pupils turning yellow. Mem, she tells her brother that there's too much bright light, she can't see anything. Meanwhile, Yun Feng lifts up the door with one hand, the material of which is one of the rarest in the world. Suddenly, metal-colored tentacles restrain the sage's body. In front of him, he sees the false Lin. The tentacles from her mouth have bound him. She laughs. Wahaha, she's finally free, and screams for the world to bow down to her. She says that she just got out and already met a great host, thanking Yunfeng for letting her out into the wild. Yunfeng is immobilized. With one hand he holds the door slid up high, the other hand is chained to his body with tentacles. She wants to take the sage's body for herself right now. Many more tentacles come out from false Lin's mouth. Yunfeng smiles. The girl feels that she can't move. She is restrained by six golden rings. She didn't expect it. What the hell is this? Demands the sage to release her quickly. Yun Feng says he knew something was wrong right away. Does the girl really think she's made up a convincing story? She's full of inconsistencies. False Lin is angry. What did he say? Yun Feng explains. Firstly, the magic barrier here does not prevent outside intrusion at all. On the contrary, its job is to keep out what's inside. Second, in her touching tale, her parents are the two people in the freezing chambers. However, the so-called Mon has no fatal injuries. She may well have had time to release her daughter. The girl asks, then why did the sage let her out? Yunfeng replies with a smirk that he is unrivaled in the Celestial Celestial Empire and is not afraid of any plots and intrigues. Also, because his children really like the image of False Lin's big sister, and he does not wish to disappoint them, the girl smiles slyly and says, I bet they'll be so upset. Sage is attacked from behind by the robot girl in the yellow suit he saw as soon as he stepped inside. This high-energy cannon is powered by nuclear reactions. False Lin screams at the sage like a madwoman wishing him dead. She'd rather take that kid's body. From behind, the sage is attacked by the robot girl in the yellow suit he saw as soon as he stepped inside. He turns around and pink flames erupt out of his mouth, pulling the robot girl into his mouth. Celestial takeover. The flames go beyond the planet. Yun Feng swallow her. False Lin is very frightened. The sage tells her that this is the first time she has seen him, and she already wants to kill him. So be it, he will have to destroy her. The tentacles from her mouth that are restraining the sage loosened their grip and let go. The girl pulls them back in. She apologizes, calling the sage the strongest, says that her mind has become clouded, begs to spare her puny life. Yun Feng waves her freed hand so that the rings restraining her break. Untied, the girl falls to her knees and bows to the floor, thanks the strongest for his mercy. She cries, then rises on her hands and stares intently into the sage's eyes. Deep hypnosis, the false Ling chuckles. Yee hee hee, ah ha covers his mouth with his hand. Says, Ancient wisdom is a wolf in sheep's clothing. In so many years, mankind's brains have not increased at all. Suddenly the girl starts to get chills. Lin Gang's subconscious. Dark. Yun Feng floats inside a yellow glowing sphere in front of a huge monster with tentacles. The monster asks how the sage was able to enter here. Who is even capable of entering the subconscious mind without the latest special equipment? 
The sage says the monster will regret messing with him. He casts a spell, a bright glow, purification of the soul. The yellow orb explodes. The beast screams. No, don't. She's realized everything. She can be useful. The explosion destroys the monster. Yunfeng floats inside the yellow glowing sphere. There's no one around. False Lin is standing on all fours on a dilapidated pora. A clear liquid flows out of her mouth. Yunfeng is standing across from her. The girl is vomiting. Boo. Something that looks like a metal robot head on tentacles falls out of her mouth. The girl is surprised and doesn't understand what's going on, twisting her head from side to side. She asks Yunfeng who he is, where are her parents, and faints. The children, Zhu Zi and Lian Sheng, hovering in the air protected by a yellow aura near the cliff, see their father flying towards them with their older sister Lin in his arms. The children fly towards him screaming. Big sister Lin Gang. Big sister. They are startled seeing the unconscious girl. In the house, Lin is lying on a bed. The children and Yunfen are standing next to each other. The children's mom sits next to them on a chair and measures the pulse of the girl with blue hair. Zhu Zi and Lian Sheng are very excited. Their mom is sighing. The sage wonders, well, the woman says everything is fine. One can only marvel at the power of these ancient techniques. The girl is exhausted, only her consciousness is somewhat. Yunfen doesn't let her finish, puts her index finger to her lips, whispers something to her. The children's mother agrees with him, nods and smilingly tells the children that their little sister Gan is fine, she just needs to rest, asks the children to go play for now. Zhu Zi and Lian Sheng happily agree. Could. They run out of the room. Yunfeng tells the woman that the ancient people were terribly weak, but had incredible techniques. When the blue-haired girl wakes up, it's worth asking her about it. The woman says she understands her brother Feng. In Yunfeng's subconscious, a female voice asks him to come back soon. Her search is successful. He puts his hand on the head of Zhu Zi and Lian Sheng's mom and says that he must return to the Yi clan, and asks them to take care of the children. The woman agrees. Sure enough. The sage turns to go to the door goes, suddenly stops. Turns around and tells her that as parents, they should support Zhu Zi's interests. The woman smiles and agrees. Aha, uh -huh, absolutely. He then asks her to tell the children that he's gone. Promises he will visit them often. He leaves. The kids playing in the yard see this. They run after him and shout daddy. They run up to the wise man and ask him where he's going. They cling to his hands. The children have tears in their eyes. Yunfen exhales, sits down on one knee, and says that before he leaves them, Daddy is going to show them an entertaining technique, and asks how they like the idea.